Hi, I'm Tom Scholey, author of I Am Stan, a graphic biography of the legendary Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. And today I'm going to talk about another one of my books, Fantastic Four Grand Design. I'm really proud of the cover on this one uh, with the silhouettes of the individual members. And to me, the best part is that how the invisible girl is also present, that, that uh, she see, it seems like she's not there, but if you hold it at a certain angle, you can see her uh, a glint of, of light reflected off of her. So that I'm very proud of that, that little flourish. So let's get started. Tom Scioli, Fantastic Four Grand Design. I thought I would do a, a table of contents that emphasizes the, the world of the Fantastic Four rather than than the characters. I, I'd done a version of that, but it was, it was to me, it was a little too similar to what had come before with, um, you know, like the original treasury editions where you'd have like a John Biasema, um, you know, drawing of just like as many characters crammed in there as possible, um, or, you know, what, what Ed Pisker did with his uh, X-Men grand design. Uh, and so I, I just, I didn't want to repeat all that. So I thought, you know, instead of emphasizing uh, individual characters, let me emphasize the the environment, the world that they live in. So you have sort of, you have Manhattan and the Baxter building. You have Atlantis, uh, the land of Submariner. You have, uh, you know, the underground kingdom, the underground empire of of the Mole Man. Then you have the uh, Prester John's uh, little uh, lost kingdom. And then you have Latveria um, and, and a little uh, remembrance of the great t uh, story where um, Dr. Doom and the Silver Surfer meet. And then you're in sort of, you know, cosmic, the cosmic space of, of the Fantastic Four and, and um, Galactus's world ship. And then you have the, the negative zone or subspace over here. So, you know, that, that was my take on it. So this is almost like a map of the, of the universe of the Fantastic Four. Uh, what was the cover of the first individual issue. Here's where the story begins. This was part of my initial pitch and my initial, you know, proposal pages. And I had done, done a version of this and, and posted it online, um, you know, at a point when I thought this project was uh, in limbo and just probably wasn't going to happen. So I, I figured, you know, why not share it? So I, I, I shared this. And, and then not too long after I, I got the call from, from Marvel that, that they did indeed want to do this comic. And I start with the premise that the story of the Fantastic Four is the story of the Marvel Universe, since so much of what makes up the Marvel Universe happened in the pages of the Fantastic Four. So I wanted to establish this, this larger universe, a Ditko creation. I thought, you know, like that, he's, it's just great. Like I always loved that, that image, even though it's not something Jack Kirby created, it's, it's, it's up there. It's worthy. It's, uh, you know, belongs alongside Kirby's great creations. And I thought, you know, he, that if I want to sort of embody the universe and, and tell the story of the universe, what a great way to start. And so I start with four astronauts walk into a, a rocket. Stop me if you've heard this one before. And so the idea, we have these four astronauts in their, you know, colorful costumes going on, on a, an important mission. And, um, you know, you assume that, oh, maybe this is the Fantastic Four, uh, but it is not. It is a prior incarnation of the Fantastic Four, which is actually the mission that that Galactus went on. That Galactus was, uh, you know, part of a mission to save the planet Ta. The Watcher is bearing witness to, you know, sort of a callback to uh, one of the things that um, that Ed had established in his grand design. Um, you know, I. I I thought that that was, you know, like a good call that that um, the watcher is sort of, you know, the teller of the tale, at least in the beginning. And then it switches off to the various members of the Fantastic Four sort of telling their side of the story. And so he witnesses this this rocket take off and, and, and echoes very closely to the story of the Fantastic Four. The watcher goes and, and again, he just watches. I watch, I watch. And he sees this mission go wrong. He sees this uh, astronaut uh, dying and, and uh, reaching out for help and begging him. And the Watcher takes a step back, takes a step back, refuses to touch him, turns his back on this, this astronaut who's, who's clearly in pain and suffering. I watch until there is nothing left to see. I am Uatu the Watcher, not Uatu the actor. But then he decides for the first time in, in his life to stop watching and start acting. For the first time in an eternity, 
I act. Only the slightest of efforts is required. I gently nudge him towards survival. He saves uh, Galen, this astronaut's life, but in so doing um, creates, you know, turns him into Galactus. The process he uses to save him gets a little bit out of control and he becomes Galactus. And then we, uh, you know, get this little, you know, echo of, you know, the famous confrontation of those two characters in the coming of Galactus. And, and so he's created a monster and, and that, um, you know, this kind of, th this is, you know, the original sin of the Marvel universe is that uh, Uatu, who's only supposed to watch, actually intervened and, and you know, caused all this trouble, caused uh, Galactus to be. Which, like, in the, in the original, like, the printed version, it's, it's, the story's told a little differently. Stan has the dialogue written as such that, that the Watcher is not intervening. But if you look at Kirby's art and his, and his um, like, liner notes, he clearly intended that uh, what I show here, that the, the, the Watcher saves Galen's life, causing him to become Galactus, that becomes the origin story of why the Watcher doesn't want to interfere. Like one time he interfered and it was, the results were disastrous. And so now again, we're getting, uh, you know, sort of the birth of the Marvel Universe. And I'm, I'm trying to create as many Fantastic Fours as I can, that, that this, you know, Fantastic Four, this, this foursome is, a, is like a motif that's just ingrained into this universe. And so uh, we get this Fantastic Four of the Eternals. And again, also trying, tr just trying to fold in all the things that kind of interest me about the Marvel Universe. Uh, again, like, who knows how many chances you're going to get to make a Marvel comic this was this was my one chance. I, I have worked on a few Marvel comics here and there, uh, in in sort of you know smaller capacities. But th this is the first time I'm writing and drawing uh, and conceiving of the project. So and I, I haven't uh, done anything for Marvel since. So um, you know if, if this ends up being my only bite of the apple, I wanted to take you know as big a bite as I could. And so I have uh, the Eternals and Devil Dinosaur, and um, that the Eternals came to Earth. Uh, they tampered with the uh, primates that they found and created, you know, men and gods and, and uh, deviants, mutants. But then they also did the same thing to the dinosaurs. And that's how we got the sort of, you know, Marvel monsters like Fin Fang Foom. You know, and then we have sort of, you know, alien visitations of, of the Kree. And um, I always liked the uh, Kree uh, supreme commander who, or the Supreme Intelligence, who, um, I, I get the impression looking at Kirby's drawings, he intended the Kree Supreme Intelligence to be a worm. And I've, I've sort of talked about my theory, uh, I, I've, I wrote an article about, like, my theory about it, that, that you know, Kirby had sort of drawn this, like, worm creature, uh, and I, I think it was, you know, possibly a play on Mr. Mind. We sort of have, you know, Captain Marvel, and, and, and what if, you know, behind it all is this, uh, you know, tiny worm that's that's instructing everything. This very cool looking tiny alien worm, but Kirby never got to sort of you know revisit that. So when subsequent artists uh, drew it, they just drew the face. They kind of made him into like a floating potato, just sort of a floating head. Where I think Kirby clearly uh, intended for him to be a worm. And so I I bring back that worm. And at this point in the history, the the Kree Supreme Intelligence uh, is a beast of burden or, or or a mount that that they that they ride again just having as much fun as I can playing with the elements of, of, the, of the Marvel mythology and, and making it into a very uh, enjoyable and satisfying whole. And so we have sort of, uh, you know, Kirby's um, mythologies, if you uh, think of them as all being part of the same story rather than, than independent stories, uh, they, they, you know, there are redundancies. So there's At Adelan and Atlantis. And so I work the, the sort of redundancies into the story that that Adeline and Atlantis are sort of the twin cities of the ancient world, and um, and that the the birth of the Inhumans. I'm I'm using uh, a lot of like Kirby's original intentions, uh, the the things that didn't make it to the final printed book. So he had a really great uh, Tales of the of the Inhumans story about uh, the Sentry coming to Earth and what his purpose was, which which was again subverted by. Stan's uh, verbiage in the story, so so you actually lose a lot of the impact. So I I tried to restore some of that, and that uh, again some more sort of like you know original sin that 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 
you know, forces the Inhumans to uh, live on a separate destiny that, that, that may prove their undoing. And so we have Atlantis, and then you have the Lemurians who declare war on the gods and are punished. And even though it was the sin of, of their sister city, Lemuria, Atlantis too was punished and was sunk sunk beneath the sea and, and, and that they uh, you know, learned to adapt to their new uh, undersea environment. And now I get to, I thought it might be fun to take all the sort of time travel stories of the Fantastic Four and present them in chronological order. So it's kind of like, okay, here's something happening in the ancient world with a, a, a pharaoh and his spectral, you know, ghostly bride. But it's like, no, this is, this is Sue Storm from, you know, the, one of the early, like, Rama Tut stories and, and that he had these three, you know, without sort of an explanation of like, oh, these are the Fantastic Four traveling through time. Just sort of present it matter of fact that this is, this is the chronology of the Earth. This is what the story of Earth would look like to the Watcher Who's, who's watching it unfold in chronological order. And so this is the Watcher's first glimpse of the Fantastic Four, is sort of seeing them unstuck from time and being incredibly intrigued. And, and so he's sort of taking a mental note so that, uh, you know, thousands of years later, when they show up again, it's like, ooh, there they are again. And, and they're, they're very special and very important and very dear to the Watcher. So these kind of sequences are sort of my favorite, these sort of silent sequences, uh, so um, Galactus opening his hand and inside is the Silver Surfer and the Silver, Silver Surfer flies away. And again, I'm returning it to Kirby's original intention that the Silver Surfer in Fantastic Four Grand Design is not Norin Rad. He's not uh, from the planet uh, Xanadar or Xanadax or whatever, it is, uh, Xanadu or whatever, that he's, he's this uh, pure energy creation uh, that was created by Galactus and almost an extension of Galactus uh, sort of, you know, God creating an angel. Uh, so, so I restored him to that because I, I just I find that uh, version of the character just so much more satisfying than the the what ended up being sort of the official version that that, that Kirby was not a part of. I get to tell the story of the Sphinx, which is sort of a, a not a character that Kirby created, but a character definitely created. Um, I think it might have been Marv Wolfman or Len Wein as sort of like a tribute to like a Kirby style character, uh, sort of a, a tribute to Darkseid. And so I incorporated him in, and, and his origin is part of the ancient days. So again, I'm, I'm trying to think of like as many Fantastic Four characters or Fantastic Four adjacent characters. And, and again, you know, he made his first appearance in the Fantastic Four. Um, trying to think of as many of them as I can that are part of the ancient world. So I can sort of create this like ancient Marvel Universe, sort of, you know, what, what was going on in the Marvel Universe in, in, in the days of old, this sort of secret history of the planet, what, what you would read about in, like, um, the, the secret Bible of the Marvel Universe. And so I, um, his origin was sort of tied to the story of Moses, so I thought that was really fun to incorporate, and, and uh, so I incorporated, like, the story of Moses, and, and he's the disgraced Egyptian wizard who um, Moses... Uh, you know, defeats in a in a magic battle and sort of you know embarrasses. So he's exiled and and then finds this crystal that makes him into the Sphinx and the the face falls off the Sphinx where he finds it. And we get into sort of the 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 turf battle that the Cree and the Skrull had on ancient Earth that they had this ongoing war and it it, it came Earth gets dragged into it. A brotherhood and Illuminatus is created to sort of keep this secret history of the universe, uh, the secret history of Earth and the secret history of these alien visitations as a sort of safeguard against them to sort of, you know, this is secret knowledge and, and it's their, their job to sort of be aware of this stuff and, and, and guard Earth from it. And, and this sort of high priest of a vestment that sort of, you know, modeled after Galactus's uh, costume. And we have sort of this sort of occult symbol that, that, you know, becomes the basis for Captain America's shield. And then the story of Prester John, what was Prester John in, in, involved in? And he goes to the land of Avalon, uh, which is sort of like another dimension here and gets, gets this cosmic eye. This is one of my favorite bits and it would have been nice to expand on this more, but again, this, I love Thor and I was very close to pitching a Thor grand design, but just Fantastic Four grand design made more sense to me. So that's what I ended up pitching. But uh, I, I am a huge fan of, of Thor. Uh, I'm, I'm more of a Thor fan than I am of Fantastic Four, although I, I love them both. Uh, and so this little bit, I thought, man, this is fun. Among Earth's many conquerors were the Rainbow Travelers. 
the Azer. Their reign didn't last long. They kept getting in their own way. You know, sort of a reference to to those stories and, and you know, Loki and, and whatnot, you know, sort of uh, the, them being sort of eaten away from the inside. But this this part I liked, uh, giving the Asgardians these lightsabers instead of, you know, like just the regular swords and, and calling them the Rainbow Riders. It's just, you know, it's a lot of fun. Got to sort of, you know, create a universe in one panel. And an, a reference to a Strange Tales story where where the Thing and Johnny Storm go back in time and, and become servants of Merlin, you know, and so they become, you know, Merlin, they're time travelers, but Merlin and, you know, Uatu, the, the narrator, views them as as demons that, that, that uh, Merlin has conjured. And, uh, you know, and Merlin's, and, and Uatu's kind of like noticing like, oh, there's, there's those two figures again that I was kind of fascinated by. And then um, I sort of tie in the Infinity Stones. I think, I think there was like a gem or something uh, in that Strange Tales story, but I, I make this sort of the, incorporate the Infinity Gems into it. They're, they're sort of, you know, Merlin's magic gems. And then we get to uh, one of the earliest time travel stories of the Fantastic Four, which is the story of Thingbeard. It's the first appearance of Doctor Doom, and Doctor Doom sends them back in time, and, and the Thing becomes Thingbeard the pirate, who becomes the basis for the stories of of Blackbeard and and uh, Reed and and Johnny are part of the crew, but I thought uh, I I refer to uh, Reed Richards as Sir Richard Reed, which was uh, Neil Gaiman's Reed Richards equivalent in the 1602 series. So I f- figure like they're having those sort of 1602 sort of adventures uh, that that they had sort of been sent back in time by Doctor Doom, and who knows how long they were back in time. It's all wrapped up in one issue, but. Um, my thought is that, that that they had this whole career as pirates um, before they got sent back to, uh, you know, 1961 to sort of, you know, uh, finish that issue and, and, and defeat Dr. Doom. And so this becomes like an important part of the story later on, this sort of playing pirate. And, and among the things, Blackbeard's, Thingbeard's treasure, among them are um, Merlin's Infinity Gems, but... But the thing doesn't really think much of them. And, and then here's the ship and here's dad. And so here's a little, remember this panel for later in the story. Dad, um, this uh, little blonde guy floating in the middle of the ocean. Climb aboard, landlubber. So, you know, play, playing with time travel stories and where you can sort of uh, do interesting things with, with a non-linear narrative. And so now we're getting into the birth of Black Bolt of the, Etern- of the Inhumans. We, and I sort of use this you know, analglyphic uh, thing for like manifestations uh, of sonic power, which is like a motif I used in Final Frontier, my uh, my creator-owned comic that is, uh, among other things, a uh, tribute to Fantastic Four. And we get, um, you know, the creation of that tuning fork and that, that it's, you know, like this very bloody, very violent process. Um, you know, the Inhumans suffer. Suffering is, is, is part of the story of the Inhumans. Um, and so the family comes together, but then while Black Bolt is away in the night, uh, his brother Maximus makes sort of a power move uh, with his alpha primitives, and, and um, uh, Black Bolt's little family unit are forced to flee, and Medusa is separated from the rest uh, and sort of lives in a cave, and, and which is sort of why she is established separately um, when, when she's introduced why she's sort of a separate character before the rest of the Inhumans get introduced. And then when I was when I was making this comic, this was right around the time the um, Black Panther movie came out, and I was, was very impressed with that movie, really enjoyed it. And so I incorporated some some things from that about the uh, vibranium meteor crashing, creating the vibranium mound, and and the Black Panther god, and all this kind of stuff. And then you know flow into the the sort of um, you know stuff from from uh, Black Panthers first appearance in Fantastic Four, uh, which is, you know, where Black Panther was originated. And so I, I give Black Panther a full page because he is an important part of the Fantastic Four story. And he did he did begin life as an antagonist for the, the Fantastic Four. And so, you know, he's important. You know, people talk about what's, who has the greatest um, rogues gallery in comics? And, and a lot of people say, oh, Batman, Spider-Man. But to me, it's the Fantastic Four, hands down, because their rogues gallery, the people who were sort of, you know, the bad guys or the, or the villains or the people they went up against, the, the people they fought, were so compelling that they almost immediately outgrew that role and became stars in their own right. 
And you can't really say that about too many of Batman's villains or too many of Spider-Man's villains, but, but with the Fantastic Four, it's like one after the other. So you have the Black Panther who starts out, you know, he's, he's trying to capture the Fantastic Four and he's putting them through the ringer. And then, uh, and that's the first issue he shows up in. And then the next issue he shows up and you find out there's more to the story. He's sympathetic. He becomes their friend. And before long, he's got his own comic, his own series of movies. Uh, you know, you know, Batman, he sort, he sort of exists in this universe, this sort of hostile, um, paranoid universe where everybody's an enemy. But um, the Fantastic Four are sort of like a more enlightened group. And they, when they, uh, so often, I mean, they do have their share of sort of enemies who become bitter rivals. But so many of, of the sort of enemies they face uh, it becomes almost like like a story of like the Knights of Arthur or something where like you fight, uh, uh, you, you know, Arthur fights Sir Lancelot and then Sir Lancelot becomes one of his Knights of Camelot. You sort of, you, you, you fight a knight. Once that knight is defeated, um, they, they join your team. And that's, that's exactly what happens in the, in the case of, of um, the Black Panther. And so, and then I get to sort of make a synthesis of, of multiple ages of Jack Kirby comics and, and fuse them together into one narrative in a real satisfying way. So I get, um, you know, I get some stuff from the movies, some stuff from, you know, the old 60s comics. And then I get to incorporate some of the stuff from Jack Kirby's 70s Black Panther story all in one page and then get a nice shot of of uh, T'Challa, of, of the Black Panther, and making sort of a hybrid of the Black Panther as we know him, uh, you know, with, you know, the cape and everything uh, as he appeared on the cover of his first appearance, uh, but then also fusing that with Jack Kirby's first drawing of the character, which was initially, um, the character was going was to be called Cole Tiger. And and he drew this drawing, you know, this, this sort of same pose, and then he repurposed it into the Black Panther. So I, tr- I tried to bring some of those, those elements as well, uh, in addition to my own flourishes, you know, adding a little bit of color to the costume. I did the same thing for Submariner. I gave him his own page because, again, he's, you know, he's a, he's a co-star of the Fantastic Four book. The Fantastic Four has the greatest supporting cast of all time. Uh, the, and um, Namor was one of them. And, and, I mean, Namor was not a Jack Kirby creation, not a Stan Lee creation. He was a creation of Bill Everett. But they, they um, sort of, you know, took Submariner and ran with him and, and did a lot of interesting things uh, with him, I think I think partly because of their their admiration and respect of of Bill Everett and the work that he did, they were they were just both Jack and Stan were both, both huge fans of of the man and his work, and so Namor becomes you know like a co star of the Fantastic Four, and so I got to retell the story of Namor, incorporating elements from Bill Everett's comics, from Jack Kirby's comics, and putting my own spin on it too. Um, some Gil Kane stuff. This this is uh, this panel is you know completely original on my part, and then the inevitable nuclear destruction. Uh, you know it was bad in the beginning when uh, you know mankind would dump their garbage on Atlantis, but uh, for them to eventually you know dump their their you know test their nuclear weapons down there uh, that was that was that was a bridge too far. And then again another co-star of the book. Uh, one of the villains who becomes, you know, like stays pretty, stays pretty steadily, a, like a, a a bitter adversary is Doctor Doom, and so he gets his own page too, and, and I get to retell his story again. I'm I'm you know creating something out of out of you know this incredibly great uh, raw material, like the, the the established mythology of of the Fantastic Four that Jack Kirby and Stan Lee did is just such an incredible body of work, and so to use that as almost like a first draft for making a, a graphic novel. Um, it's really a case of standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, the whole story of Dr. Doom. Hey, Reed, you ever hear from that creep Victor from college? Can't say I have, Ben. Finally, we get to tell the story of the Fantastic Four themselves. And so I start with the story of Ben Grimm and, and his childhood and his brother and, and you know, the, the twists and turns his life took. And so as, as a, lo- a little sort of, you know, subconscious... Uh, clue that we're we're hearing from Ben Grimm as I I you know have his narration written in Thing Orange, and we get the story of his brother and his brother's sort of a gang leader and and his saying is it's clobber his brother's saying is it's clobbering time, you know becomes an Air Force pilot and and I made a point to not specify what time this 
story takes place in. I'd sort of toyed with the idea of making it into a 60s period piece, but I, I felt like that wasn't the way to go, ultimately. That, um, that, to me, superhero comics exist in the eternal present. It's like you go there every month and you pick up an issue to find out what's happening with the Fantastic Four or Thor or uh, you know Batman, what's happening with them right now. And so I wanted to give this that quality. So I, I give... I said, if I had said it in the 60s, then that would mean that, uh, you know, or, or Kirby's original time frame where Ben Grimm and, and Reed Richards fought in World War II, like Kirby himself, I thought that would, that would sort of limit things too much. I wanted to make it unstuck from time so that may, maybe it's World War II or maybe it's, you know, the 80s, maybe it's the 90s, maybe it's the 2000s, maybe it's the 2010s, maybe it's the 2020s. And so we get his story and then we get the, the beginning of the story of Fantastic Limited where Reed and, and Ben start this um this this uh, technology company this this uh, consulting company sue storm works for them i dress him in orange whenever i can and i give him this you know orange puffy uh you know gore-tex coat uh you know just to kind of again sort of reference like the form that he's going to take when he becomes the thing we get reed richard's story he gets his own page and i knew like once i sort of established the individual story of each member of the fantastic four that from there i could really do anything that, that, that i just need to kind of um you know the the sort of first part of the hero's journey just sort of show the the, the heroes in their normal setting and, and what their normal life is like before taking them on on this crazy odyssey um you know the, to just sort of start there and so I, so i do that i start with reed richards um, he solves the Rubik's Cube, but then his father finds out that he actually, he admits to his father that he, he took the stickers off and, and rearranged it after his father, you know, uh, went to great expense getting him, you know, tested as a genius and this and that, bec you know, uh, because of this. And, and, and it, it's incredibly embarrassing to uh, Nathaniel Richards, to his father. You know, he joins the army. And again, it's like, is he in World War II? Is he in Vietnam? And I thought, you know what, let me just Make it unspecified. So, so I, I almost sort of draw sort of like the the desert wars that um, America has has been involved in since the '90s, uh, but but it's you know completely unspecified. And and he very well could be um, you know in World War II for all we know. I in the desert seeing uh, the Human Torch in action, and then we get the story of Sue Storm and her brother. I I sort of uh, collapse the put the put the storm the Storm siblings together and, and their sort of tragic life and all the things we knew about their mother and their, and their father and, and how, you know, he was, he, you know, went to jail. In the comics, he went to jail for, I, I forget what, I think like ro armed robbery or something, but I, I thought it'd be more interesting for him to go to jail um, for, you know, selling bogus prescriptions for drugs. And, you know, and then Johnny, you know, steals a car and, and uh, Sue asks, Ben to go get him, and there's a little... I, I love drawing car chases in comics. It's a lot of fun. And then we get what we think is the first, you know, space mission of the Fantastic Four, but it looks... It's... As it turns out, it's it's the... Um, it's the simulator. They're in their simulator. What's the matter, Reed? They've killed it. My life's work. The contract is canceled. You know, talking about this rocket that, that they'd been working on for, for years. Uh... Uh, Reed's brainchild that that he you know talks about as early as as uh, Johnny says we could jack it, and so they're going to um, hijack this this rocket, and so we get a a retelling of you know the origin of of the Fantastic Four as told in the uh, original comic. This is one of the first pages that I drew for this series, and I drew it a number of times, and I was trying to think of a new and interesting way of doing it, and I was was going to make the comic. Uh, like a four by four tiers, you know, with these grand designs, you have to get a lot of information in, in 80 pages. And so I thought, okay, a four by four grid, but, and you know, it's the fantastic four, a four by four grid. Perfect. But it just, um, what ended up happening is it looked too similar to the, it looked too similar to the old comics. And I wanted something that, that, you know, had a completely different aesthetic that, that, uh, you know, broke some new ground. I changed it to a five by five grid, which is what this this follows and, and what the rest of the issue follows. But this is the first four. And so I did a four by four version of this, but again, it was too close to what was in the original comic. And I, I, I didn't want to, you know, repeat what came before. I wanted to find different different ways of looking at it. And so, and this scene, you're talking about stealing a rocket 
from Uncle Sam, count me out. Gosh, Ben, I, I never thought that you would be a coward. In the original comic, we have sort of, you know, typical, uh, you know, Jack Kirby histrionics where uh, the thing takes his fist and, and, or Ben Grimm takes his fist and, and slams the desk and like starts breaking things. But I thought it would be nice to have like a little burn instead. Like she says this and then everybody's just kind of like frozen and looking at each other. You know, technically this is an act of terrorism then we're terrorists. And I like playing with the idea of the Fantastic Four like as possibly being sinister. I, th I think that is a big part of the appeal of the characters initially. Um, and, and it's completely forgotten by history. We think of them as sort of these goody goodies, this you know space family Robinson of comics, these sort of aw shucks golly gee kind of characters. But I think part of their appeal in the beginning is they were very, you know, scary and, and transgressive and, and punk rock compared to, you know, Superman or, uh, you know, what was going on across the street. You know, may, maybe they are terrorists. Maybe they, they are, you know, are they good guys or bad guys? You know, I, I wanted to bring some of that back to the Fantastic Four because I feel like Fantastic Four lost that element a long, long time ago. Other comics, some of them created by Jack Kirby and Stan Lee, but other comics had sort of continued that sort of, uh, you know, dangerous element of danger and, and benefited from it. And, and that, that the Fantastic Four have suffered from being these sort of, um, you know, Saturday evening post mom and apple pie kind of characters. And so, uh, and they put on these ski masks, which are reminiscent of the helmets that the helmet that, um, Sue Storm designs for the thing in, I believe, uh, Fantastic Four issue three, and then they sneak onto the base. And I thought about possibly having them sort of garret and choke uh, the the guys who are guarding this base, but um, I thought that was a, I thought that was a step too far. They, um, I think Wizard Magazine had something like that in one of their uh, you know toy fair, you know toy theater or whatever, where they they you know tell different comic stories with with photos of action figures um they had done that and and i contemplated putting that in there but that, that would have been a step too far that would have established that no it's not like we're not sure if they're good guys or bad guys they're definitely bad guys and, and i didn't want to do that a lift off they go into space i'm on fire again try, trying to figure out a different way of telling that story and then this panel here of the rocket crashing and again this is famous stuff but i thought an, an interesting way of showing the invisible girl's invisibility would be uh, you know, the dotted lines are a cartoon convention. It's a way of showing invisibility uh, with symbolic language. So I thought, well, why not use a different kind of symbolic language? So I'll use sort of the, the visible woman toy kind of thing where you see all the veins and the heart and the, and, and the thing, and making it into a little more of like a, like a body horror sort of thing. So uh, when she's invisible or when she's turning invisible to, to sort of show her that way as opposed to a dotted line. And I, I really had a lot of fun with it, the horror of it. Initially, I had in this word balloon, uh, they're saying, what the F? And then the F is like the Fantastic Four F. But, um, you know, that, was, that wasn't gonna fly. They told me I had to change that. So I changed it to what the, which is uh, a, a Marvel comic from the 80s. I'm myself again. And, and then now we get, uh, you know, this little battle here, just, just having a lot of fun with it. And now Johnny's catching fire. And, and my thought, the same way, um, Sue, I depict her that way. I thought I could depict Johnny as, as almost like all those little lines that Jack Kirby would draw on him. I, I almost make those into like musculature lines. So, so, uh, Johnny, when he, he turns into the human torch that he'd be sort of this like, uh, skinned, uh, character. He'd, he'd sort of, you know, just, just look like exposed muscle, which is, you know, comes across in some panels. It's a little, it's a little hard to come across in a comic where, where it's, it's made out of these, these elements that are, you know, very, these panels that are very small, but it's in there and, it, and, and it's on, it's in the back cover. It, it's sort of most evident in the back cover. And so they decide to keep this whole thing a secret because they're, 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 they're criminals. You know, they, they can't let anybody know that they did this. Uh, and so they are on the run. They are fugitives. Masked terrorists hijack rocket. Missing rocket in fiery crash. Caught on camera. Who are the mystery four? And now we have um, the beginning of Fantastic Four issue one. Reed Richards, Lonely Genius. I tried to make it look as though, you know, Reed Richards opens this drawer. There's a gun inside. He loads it. I tried to make it look as though he was maybe contemplating suicide. But 
Um, he was contemplating a different kind of suicide. He was throwing out the Fantastic Four signal, the signal that they that they'd sort of agreed that at some point they would, you know, if if, if required, they would they would come back together. And and so we see a uh, a necklace, and then we see a necklace levitating into the air. Sue Storm, high society grifter. It's good to treat yourself every once in a while. And there's the the number four. Had the idea of of Sue sort of. Sp- Spending her time in between the accident and now, sort of, you know, getting by uh, on being sort of like a like a con artist. That that you know things had gotten very desperate in her life, and so she sort of, you know, resorts to that. Um, there's uh, issue two of the Fantastic Four where where it's uh, the introduction of the scrolls, and there's scenes early on where the Fantastic Four are doing all these horrible things, and uh, it's implied but never directly spelled out that. It was actually scroll imposters doing it, so I thought it might be interesting to, um, instead of it being scroll imposters, to make those scenes actually be things that the Fantastic Four are doing. There's sort of like a superhero code of conduct, a sort of superhero morality, but I I wanted to make these characters sort of you know free of that, or at least at least start out that way. It makes them more mysterious, you know, makes you sort of wonder like. What is their deal? You know, what are they doing? And so I get to get to retell it and, and retell it in interesting ways. There's the shadow of of the four signal on, on that building. There's the reflection of it in in uh, in the things cheaters. I'm sorry, sir. This is the largest pair we have. Uh, there's um, the guy at the store holding up you know Michael Habranco's pants. You call this a big and tall? Hey, what's that? Nothing good. So I mean, I get to get to retell these really like amazing. Uh, Jack Kirby moments and and reference these amazing Jack Kirby drawings. Can a guy go walking without being hassled? And then he g- goes underground. And then we get uh, we got her purring like a lamb, Johnny. Good, that's the way I like her. Hey, Johnny, look in the sky. Flame on. You know, it's just, it's just so much fun doing this. This this really was a dream project. I I had so much fun. You know, they're all called to to the first meeting of the Fantastic Four. You got my message. It's our second chance. A way to go public. We'll be superheroes. Submariner's gone, the Human Torch, Captain America. We can be the good guys. We just need the right foe, the right mission, and one just dropped in our laps. Look, we don't want to see your dirty Polaroid collection, Reed. In Fantastic Four number one, Reed is showing them pictures and uh, the things like, what are they, pinups? So I thought, you know, let's let's take that idea and, and just, you know, push it forward a little, uh, just a, a a little bit more. So, uh, you trying to show us your dirty Polaroid collection, Reed? Get to get to retell all this stuff. Man, so much fun. Uh, you know, there Kirby has some sequences in there that are just so beautiful. And even though they don't, you know, propel the story forward in any sort of plot way, it, they're just such fun moments. And so some of them I couldn't help. You know, there's this beautiful panel by panel stick fight with the mole man and it was just so elegant and wonderful. I, I had to, you know, redraw it. I had to do it. And I thought, you know, assembling it as a series of five, you know, just make, makes it like a really, really fun read. So yeah, we're doing that. And then um, the drawings that Jack Kirby does in Fantastic Four number one seems to imply that that the Human Torch blew up the uh, mole man's underground kingdom, you know, possibly taking advantage of like flammable gases, flammable underground gases. Uh, but the, the, uh, Verbiage contradicts that, so I thought I'm I'm going to restore that that original Kirby version. So they they really do, you know, kind of more or less nuke the uh, the Mole Man's kingdom. Everybody okay? I just feel bad for the monsters. Have this little spaceship that's shaped like a water tower. It was a water tower, uh, you know, in, in the in the original Fantastic Four number two that the Skrull came to Earth in. Sue steals this guy's diamond. They're closing in on us. We've got to lie low. We know you stole that rocket. It wasn't us. We have film of you committing acts of sabotage. It wasn't us, I tell you. It was lookalikes. Yeah, sure. And maybe, you know, maybe they didn't commit all those acts of sabotage, or maybe they committed some but not others, but they're being blamed for it. And, and one of the things they're being accused of is the truth. They did steal that rocket. It was a rocket um, Reed Richards designed and, and put years into, but it was still property of the U.S. government. So it was an act of terrorism, uh, by, by a legal standard, if not by by a moral standard, and so now they're uh, you know wearing the orange jumpsuits of of prisoners and their their hoods over their heads so they can't see where they're going. 
and they're all sort of bound in there. It really, it's like, it, it's the FF in FF. It's uh, the Fantastic Four in Fast Forward. It's, it's, it's really an invigorating read. Come in through, light a match. Turns out it was Skrulls giving us a bad name. We let the army think they burnt down the prison. So this is sort of that fresh start for the Fantastic Four, the fresh start that, that Reed was looking for for them, where, um, you know, the, the fortuitous arrival of these shape-shifting Skrull aliens gave them an excuse to, to wash themselves clean, to, to blame all their past sins on the Skrulls, and now they get to be, they get to be the, the faces, they get to be the good guys. We made ourselves costumes for better branding. I built us a Batmobile, too. The, you know, fantastic car. Johnny gets sick of the whole thing, leaves, finds this bearded guy, shaves him, and it's the Submariner. I, I based the Submariner's face drawing here on, on a photo of, um, of, of young Charlie Chaplin. And he drops him in the water to refresh his memory, and boom, he's back. He brings back his... his uh, Giant monster, the thing goes inside. Ben volunteered to walk a nuke into its gullet. Well, here's a prize worth catching. And I forgot to note on, uh, it was either the Submariner page or the Sue Storm page, but that uh, Sue had seen Namor, when Sue was a child, she saw uh, uh, young Namor as a child floating in the water. Um, you know, kind of, kind of like the movie Splash, how um, Tom Hanks sees Daryl Hannah's mermaid, like when he was a kid and she was a kid, he, he sees her floating in the water and and that this idea that they're sort of destined to, to meet again. Their old college buddy, uh, Victor Von Doom, is back. He sends them back in time to get Blackbeard's treasure, closing the, the loop uh, of this sort of time travel story before. And then they're back and the thing punches him out, but, well, what do you know? He's a phony baloney. I wonder what the real Yehudi is up to. I, I got to tell you, it's so much fun writing dialogue for the thing. You know, anybody will tell you. Anybody will tell you who worked on the character. It's just so much fun. And then here's one of my favorite um, old Fantastic Four issues retold, where uh, issue six, and then we get the introduction of Alicia and the um, and her father, the Puppet Master. The Puppet Master, you know, his his puppets, like you would have to do whatever his puppets did, and so she throws his puppet, and so he goes flying out the window. The Fantastic Four have lost all their money. They, now they have to ride the subway instead of the Fantastic Car. They go to a movie studio, and it's being run by Submariner. You know, re really fun early issue. And then uh, we get Stan and Jack show up. Jack's designing a new character who ends up being Machine Man, but um, Stan rejects it. Doctor Doom comes into their office because it, it was already established that Stan and Jack were, um, you know, part of the, the Marvel Universe. They were characters within the Fantastic Four. And, um, you know, get to sort of, get to, again, close that loop. We got uh, I Am Stan, a graphic biography of the legendary Stan Lee, and Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. Uh, you'll find a pre-order link for I Am Stan in the show notes. These three books really do read as a triptych. A lot of connective tissue got to draw... Um, Dr. Doom shrinking into, into microscopic size. And then, uh, you know, one of my favorite moments in uh, the, the, the first Fantastic Four Treasury, something that, that was really a, um, you know, a guiding light for the making of, of this Treasury-sized book, uh, where the thing opens up a package from the Yancey Street Gang, gets punched in the eye. They meet a green adversary, and it's the Impossible Man. And then another green adversary, the Hulk. Um, I had fun with this panel. I, I wanted to experiment with some lighting stuff, and I did sort of a lighting trick that I got from some of uh, Steve Ditko's Charlton comics that he color himself, where you'd you'd have part of the part of the figure colored in its sort of uh, local color, and then um, hit it with like a side light of like just like pure cyan or pure magenta really i really like how that panel turned out and then we have a deep space hologram projection of of the watcher this is you know the first time he sort of enters the fantastic four story their first meeting even though he's been watching them from afar we got the red ghost and the super apes we got the thing fighting a wrestler we got the mad thinker uh, this was fun doing that sequence there the the mad thinkers uh, awesome android they get shrunken down 
We got shrunk. Keep your nut. Uh, they go down to the microverse where, where, where Dr. Doom's been living. Uh, the Super Scroll shows up. Namor's Lord of the Sea. He takes over the surface world. Uh, that was another part of this story, this idea that, that Manhattan, like Earth as a whole and sort of Manhattan specifically, has undergone a number of regimes where a, a number of invading armies have taken it over. Invading armies from Atlantis, invading armies from the microverse, in, invading armies from the Skrull homeworld. And so uh, Manhattan becomes this kind of embattled zone that's, that's you know, used, that, that's sort of got this insurgency. They, they, they're used to being under attack and, and hunkering down and fighting insurgencies, and that um, the Fantastic Four are sort of the, the front line of that insurgency. And Reed and the Submariner are fighting it out. And this is the first inkling we get that uh, Submariner, Submariner tells Reed, she doesn't love you. We make fun of you when we're together. Everything about you is ridiculous. So uh, this is where we sort of establish the idea that, that maybe, um, you know, maybe this is all just big talk. You know, maybe, maybe the Submariner is trying to psych out Reed Richards or maybe Susan, uh, the Invisible Girl, and and Submariner are romantically involved, and, and um, Reed Richards is none the wiser. So then they get sent back in time with Rama Tut, closing another, another loop that started earlier in the story. Uh, the Molecule Man takes over the island and then is disposed of by, the, by Uwadu the Watcher. Something new for my collection. Then the Hate Monger shows up. We, I, I retell that entire issue in two panels. Hate Monger shows up. They take off his mask, and it's it's Hitler under there. A story of uh, one of my favorites, one one of the first Fantastic Four stories I ever read. Um, you know, because I was a Spider Man fan, and I was reading a Spider Man comic where this happens, uh, where Spider Man tries to join the Fantastic Four. Uh, a story so nice they told it twice. Uh, Steve Ditko and Stan Lee did a version of it in Spider Man, and then uh, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee did a version of it in I think the Strange Tales Annual, and he joins, and then he gets the shit beaten out of him. And he's like, not villain, good guy, good guy. And he's doing the timeout symbol, you know, spitting out a tooth. Like he really got his clock cleaned by the Fantastic Four. Got some time travel shenanigans, an invading army uh, from uh, L'Enfant Terrible. Of all the times for the Hulk to show up, they have a big battle with the Hulk. Reed's in bad shape. The thing throws a punch at the Hulk. And inside the punch is Ant-Man and a bunch of ants. Feel that itch? It's a bunch of ants shanking you full of Reed's formula. Uh, the Invisible Girl is sort of having a moment where she's trying to decide, you know, does, does, she, does she go with Submariner? Does she stay with Reed? And it's, it's a tough call for her. Sort of, those sort of romantic triangles are such a big part of Reed is great, but Submariner is so brooding and sexy. I think I'm more attracted to Namor, but my whole life's tied up with Reed. If I go with Namor, I don't just lose Reed, I lose everything. Even my own brother would never talk to me again. I wish I could keep Namor in the Baxter Building pool. We could swim when I need him, then go back to my normal life. You pretty much said you'd rather be with me, Susan. It's not that easy. So she's got a tough decision. Um, she sort of, like, she, she loves both of them. She loves Reed and Namor. And she might be a little more attracted to Submariner, a little more, like her heart might be a little more in love with Submariner, but it's, you know, it, Reed is sort of like the real life thing, and Submariner's kind of like the fantasy. And it's like, yes, she like her heart might be telling her, go with Submariner, go with Submariner, but it's more complicated than that. It would, it would just, there's, there's more to, to her life. It would sort of, it would throw her whole life into into turmoil. It would be, it would be you know, she, she sort of, she wants both. And, and so she's just sort of staying put. She's staying where she is, but uh, sort of pining away for Submariner. There's just, you know, you, you can't do everything. You can't have your cake and eat it too. And she, she wishes she could, but, but she knows that she can't. Somebody had better start saying something. Namor, don't. Don't what? Namor, I'm sorry if you misread the situation. We can never be anything more than friends. You know, Namor leaves. Uh, they meet the they meet the X Men. Uh, they get uh, the thing gets bullied by the Yancey Street Gang some more. They have a rematch with the Red Ghost, and Uatu intervenes again. 
They meet Diablo. Turns out he was a Dracula. The thing busts out. And then um, the uh, Sue and, and Johnny's father, Franklin Storm, uh, breaks out of prison. And he's doing all kinds of stuff. And what did you do with my father? Sue never told you, Johnny. I am your father. Uh, Franklin Storm handed Johnny over to the Skrull Emperor. But then he has a last minute change of heart, saves his son. And he died a hero. Dad saved the earth, and he saved me. Some, some new alien uh, life form coming up from Atlantis. Turns out it's Dorma, the, uh, the Submariner's uh, fiance. Ben's trying on a wig, and Alicia says, I love you just as you are. La 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 love? Uh, and just, just as a, a way to sort of reuse <laughs> the panel of the thing wearing a beetle wig. I thought it might be interesting that he's trying he's trying to like improve his look. And then we have the story of the oligarch Gideon, some calamity on the campus, the uh, Spider-Man shows up, Dragon Man. You know, that was sort of the culmination of like the first phase of the Fantastic Four. And then the cosmic phase began, you know, like immediately afterwards when we learn about um, Medusa's larger family, the Inhumans. I liked, I had this idea of having different, um, climate zones within the Baxter building. So I did this sort of cutaway of it, and it's almost like a video game. They have to fight their way through. This is when Dr. Doom takes control of the Baxter building, and they have to fight their way through the tropical rainforest floor, the polar habitat, and the volcanic habitat. You know, there's always got to be a volcano level, and it's uh, it's usually the, the final level. What am I looking at? Big confrontation with Dr. Doom. Again, this was like another like culmination of months of, of story in this sort of, you know, final battle with Dr. Doom, with, with Daredevil involved. And I, I had this idea of drawing Daredevil with no eyes, kind of like um, how he's drawn, how he is in um, the Incredible Hulk, Trial of the Incredible Hulk TV movie, which was my introduction to the character of Daredevil. Love this stuff, you know, taken straight from the Kirby comic of uh, Ben Grimm slowly turning into the thing. And then he fights Dr. Doom and crushes his hands, which that becomes sort of like a big source of like this ongoing grudge between Dr. Doom and the Fantastic Four is the way the thing crushed his hands. Frightful Four action. Uh, the thing joins the Frightful Four. He gets sort of hypnotized. And then they break the spell. Today's the day. Wedding bells for Reed and Sue. And uh, we get the wedding of the Fantastic Four epic. And Namor shows up for like a last minute, like, are you sure you're sure? Can you give me a moment, Alicia? Namor, why? I thought you might need someone to walk you down the aisle. Then you may now kiss the bride. And Reed is um, kissing the invisible girl, and she is invisible. And, and so, you know, he's, he's kissing her. I, you know, that, I thought that would be an interesting moment. And it, it begs the question, it... Uh, Makes me wonder if if Sue showed up at all to their wedding, and and if Reed was just play acting and pretending that that the Invisible Girl was there. But Jack and Stan are not allowed in the wedding, you know, straight out of the comic. Just I put a just married sign and some tin cans on the back of the Fantastic Car, and then the wedding night. When when I initially drew that panel and colored it, it was all flesh colored, so it was a tangle of flesh. And you know, I, you know, I was told that 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 wasn't going to fly, and I had to put them in their costume, so I did. What are you going to do, fly away again? None of your business. That's funny. I could have sworn I left the door locked. Oh, well. I didn't enroll in college this year. Boy, what a boner. Sometimes I'm taking dialogue, you know, sometimes I'm, you know, completely, you know, writing my own dialogue. Sometimes I'm taking dialogue straight out of out of the book and that whole thing about, you know, boy, what a boner. That was, that was in the original. And uh, any, anytime I can put the word boner in a comic, I'm, I'm going to go for it. But yeah, that was that was straight out of an issue of Fantastic Four. Uh, in the rearview mirror, we see some eyes. Gorgon is stomping his foot, making an earthquake with this car. And then in the back seat behind him uh, is uh, is Medusa holding a gun to his head and, and leading her here. And um, I had done a version of this page at, where I kind of had this idea for the for Fantastic Four grand design, where it'd be sort of like uh, Jack Kirby meets Frank Miller. And so I sort of had the top half of the page was you know, Kirby riffs, and then the bottom half of the page was, um, you know, Sin City riffs, and so, um, and so this was like, you know, I, one of those early pages, and that, and that I, I also thought, like, there should be a lot of effing in the FF, so I was going to have a lot of sex scenes in it, there was going to be a lot of 
basically like the character all the characters were going to be like fucking their way through the Marvel universe. That was that was one of my early concepts of what this book could be. Um uh, again got kind of um you know toned down, you know, in the final product, but so you know we're going to be having sex and then uh Gorgon walks in on them sort of this this symbol of uh you know pan uh, concupiscence, this uh sort of uh uh, symbol of of just like raw sexuality and and then also sort of this like you know his sort of devilish appearance you know sort of of, of sort of like shame and and you know this kind of thing sort of you know like in a slasher movie how you know the characters have sex and then and then the uh, you know the killer shows up to to sort of punish them for this uh, sin Th- this is sort of the the point where like my Fantastic Four super fandom kicks in like I love the first issue of. Fantastic Four. I love issue six. I love I love various issues along the way, and 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 enjoy all of them to some extent. But but I like really love you know some of them here and there. But when Gorgon shows up, when Medusa comes to the Fantastic Four and is like, "You guys got to help me. I, I'm being chased," and the the person chasing them is Gorgon, and and you know all of a sudden Joe Sinnott is inking the book, and just. Every month, a new character or a new group of characters are being introduced, and they're amazing, and 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 each one's like sort of more cosmic and mythological than the previous. That that's where I become a uh, Fantastic Four super fan, and and so that you know, so when I was creating this, this when when we're getting to this point, it's like oh my god, you know, it's it, this this is where it starts becoming like a dream come true. It's like I can't believe I get to draw that like first image of Gorgon where he's got like the elongated face and stuff like I I, you know I can't believe like you know thinking back to when I was first reading those comics uh in I I think they were called in Marvel's greatest comics there were these reprints from the 70s and just like I can't believe I'm doing this and then Dragon Man shows up Johnny Storm is kind of you know listless and depressed and he's not sure where his life is going this superhero thing is ruining my social life. And he's got his his smartphone. And again, that was another decision. It's like, you know, does he pick up a rotary phone? Is this Does this story take place in the 60s when these comics were made? Uh, does it take place in the 80s so it can have like a retro feel, uh, but, you know, not be set too far in the past? Does it take place in the 90s? You know, same reason, you know, it, it can be retro, but... Um, and then the characters aren't going to be like 90 years old in, uh, you know, the year 2023. Uh, but I made the decision. I wanted to be timeless. And our world, like that world of rotary phones just doesn't exist anymore. Some of us have lived our entire lives with cell phones of one sort or another. There's a lot of us who've, you know, who when they were introduced to the planet Earth, uh, you know, people weren't commonly walking around with with cell phones or smartphones, but but that world just doesn't exist anymore. And with each passing year, uh, it becomes harder and harder to relate to that world. And so if you want your comic to take place in the here and now and not be a period piece, uh, you can't have somebody calling on a rotary phone. They have, they have to have a smartphone and, and uh, you know, a young person like Johnny, you know, that's, that's how he'd get in touch with people. In fact, calling her on the phone might be a little bit of an anachronism. You know, he'd probably text her. Uh, and so he goes out on a walk and again, I get to take these sequences from Kirby's comics, these these uh, panel by panel, like almost animation sequences, and do them. And that's that's one of the strengths of having this uh, five by five layout is that you can have these almost uh, animation like progressions from panel to panel as they're laid next to each other rather than, you know, panel, 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 pan, you know, you can have them just flow across. This is that period I'm talking about, like the arrival of the inhuman. So it's like, okay, you know, um, Medusa is a pre-existing character. Dragon Man's a pre-existing character, but Gorgon is all new. And then Crystal is all new. And it, it, it enters like kind of almost like fairy tale territory or, uh, you know, Greek mythology. And then, and then you have Lockjaw. I mean, this, you know, this this is really the beginning of like the great era of Fantastic Four. Like think about that a, a comic. This this was one issue where you get uh, uh, a Crystal, and then you meet Lockjaw, and then you meet the rest of the family, and you've got Karnak and 
and then we find out that this this is the big, you know, the, the A plot and the B plot line up to get, they meet, and it turns out that this crystal is connected to the, and her family is connected to the whole uh, drama of, of Gorgon and Medusa. And then we find out that there's still one more person we're yet to meet, and it's Black Bolt. And, and now, like, we've just crossed over from the, you know, sort of early Fantastic Four, sort of, uh, you know, you know, revolutionary, but still, like, well within the superhero genre as, as it had existed previously. Uh, uh, you know, revolutionary, changed a lot, but, but sort of had one foot in the old, one foot in the new. And then the arrival of Black Bolt is like, okay, we're in a completely new era, the era of cosmic and Kirby dots. And, and this was, like, when I was drawing this, this particular panel drawing Black Bolt, who's like one of my favorite Marvel characters, drawing him. That was when I I had like the the pinch yourself moment where I was like, I can't believe this is my job. I can't believe I'm getting paid to draw, you know, something, you know, th this this thing that 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 you know meant so much to me and and was so important to me, and uh, you know to sort of connect with Jack Kirby and connect with his great, you know, his great works. And, and and put my spin on them. It just it was it was a euphoric moment, you know, being being able to work on this project, and that was that was the moment where I sort of felt it the most. Try, trying to inject you know horror imagery as much as possible because my 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 theory is that oh the superhero genre is you know the most pop is like the enduring genre of comics. It's it's the it's you know what kept comics afloat and kept people kept people excited about it. Where in uh, in my opinion, it's the horror genre that kept comics alive. The horror genre has been the constant over all these years. And Marvel Comics, it's not the superhero stuff that makes them popular. It's the horror stuff. It's the fact that these are horror superheroes, that you have a monster and you have an invisible woman. And, and you know, the invisible man was was not, you know, the invisible man was part of the horror genre. The, the way that, you know, a human torch could be scary. And, and you know, the Hulk. Is, is a horror char character. The, the uh, Spider-Man has a horror motif. The spider and webs motif is a horror motif. Batman. Uh, Superman is sort of pure superhero. Like, uh, there isn't really a horror element to Superman. And as such, he's, he's the superhero that they've been struggling with uh, the most over the years. You know, Bat Batman sort of left him in the dust. And, and my theory is that it's the horror element that that you know makes batman a superstar and superman struggle to you know maintain a foothold like i'm trying to capture you know the the story of the fantastic four but you know it's also there's you know fantastic four it's also it's also a comic about drawing and sometimes the drawings are just so beautiful so i would sort of take i mean this is you know like i i, I wanted to do you know my take on this, you know, beautiful drawing, this beautiful pose that 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 Kirby did, uh, you know, of of all these, you know, characters and and the and when I was, you know, starting to like really get into Fantastic Four, this was one of the issues where this guy shows up, the Seeker, and it's like, who is this guy? What's his story? And every time a new character would show up at this point. It would. Um, it wouldn't just be like, oh, hey, you know, here, here's the the new guy who lives down the hall. Each new character would imply some new storyline, some new world or dimension or kingdom, and um, it was an exciting time to be discovering this comic and wondering, you know, where's this going? What, what's this guy's deal? How and how does it all connect? Which was also a big impetus uh, for me making this comic. Is you know. Uh, you know, as I was reading the Fantastic Four, I was like, "Man, this is so great!" And every each bit of it seems so important and so full of of drama and meaning. And it's like, it's it's all going to come together in some beautiful way. And then, you know, as, as I read and read and read, and then you know, Kirby leaves the comic, and then Stan leaves the comic. It's like, oh no, it's it's not leading towards anything. It's all just a big, all just a big tease. And so I wanted to make a comic where you know, it does all lead somewhere where, where there's some closure and that all these various threads, as many of them as I could wrangle, all sort of, you know, come together in, in, a, in like a beautiful way. This stuff was just so much fun to work on. You know, the whole story of the Inhumans. So, so we get to, you know, um, 
refer back to stuff that was established, you know, in the in the early issue in, in the early pages of, of this book. And man, that, like panels like this are, are are like so much fun to do, you know, and, and panels like this. And then this this was like the showstopper, you know, because the arrival of the Silver Surfer, you know, the 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 it's it's like um, Black Bolt is like John the Baptist, and then Silver Surfer is Jesus. Like Black Bolt kind of like signals a new era, and that that you know we're moving into something new, and it's amazing. But but it's it's you know, and as cool as Black Bolt is, it's like he's almost just just like like an appetizer before Silver Surfer shows up. And then, you know, Silver Surfer is like just like a prelude to Galactus. So it's like, you know, a comic where they introduce who you think is maybe like the coolest character you've ever seen in your life. And then an issue later, you meet a character that like blows that one away. And then you meet a character that's even cooler. Like, it's like, how long can this streak be continued? How long can Jack Kirby do this? And uh, the answer was not forever. Like it does eventually peter out, but it takes a while. It takes a while for this, this era to, to peter out. And like, you know, if, if you were a kid reading this comic as it's coming out, of course you'd think, uh, uh, of course you're reading the greatest comic of all time. Like this, this never, you know, nothing like this ever happened before. And this is, this is where like my, my real like deep love for the Fantastic Four uh, resides. I mean, the Fantastic Four themselves, they're fine, but I am a, like, I'm a super fan of their supporting cast. Like, they're, they're sort of these, these characters that are, you know, kind of interesting in their own right, but they explore a universe where on a regular basis, they're meeting like the most amazing characters you've ever seen. And, and so that's the stuff that keeps me coming back to the Fantastic Four and so Silver Surfer. And so up to this point, uh, you know, it's been these, you know, s smaller panels, you know, for, for a lot of reasons, some of which I've, I've talked about previously, but it's like, it really pays off in moments like this, where it's like all of a sudden a, an image that takes up less than half, I guess uh, two fifths, uh, you know, you can do the math, all of a sudden, a, like a a, uh, a panel that's that takes up two fifths of the page looks like a double page splash because your reading experience has you sort of zoomed in, tuned in, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, you know, um, it has, has you tuned in on this rhythm. And then when there's all of a sudden this, it's like you're looking at a double page spread. It's like, whoa, you know, you're, you're kind of knocked back by this. There's just moments in the Fantastic Four where it's like, I can't wait, I can't wait to interpret that moment. I can't wait to uh, interpret that drawing. I can't, you know, and, and this was one of them where it's like, there's no fucking way I'm gonna do the story of the Fantastic Four and not highlight this moment. You know, one of these images that like knocked me on my ass the first time I was reading this, the, the, these stories, you know? And, and again, th this series, it was, it was like a way for me to fall in love with the Fantastic Four all over again, to, to like re-experience that feeling of the new, of like that this is this is the cutting edge of comics, and anything can happen, and it's a big, beautiful, dangerous, scary world uh, that's just full of drama and meaning, uh, with uh, you know barely anything humdrum or ordinary. The the humdrum and the ordinary are at the beginning of the hero's journey, but we've left that far behind. And, you know, the journey's just getting started. You know, they're terrified of the, the Silver Surfer. So in the Skrull Galaxy, they turn off the lights. Reed Richards and, and, his, and his crew are coming back from, you know, what has been their greatest adventure so far into, uh, you know, possibly the end of the world. Wouldn't you know it, we're gone for a few days and New York goes to hell. To be continued. And so that's... Uh, that's the first half of Fantastic Four Grand Design. So it's the first half of this uh, oversized treasury edition. It would be the first. Everything that you've read up to this point is issue one of Fantastic Four Grand Design. And then the rest is issue two. It's kind of, uh, if you take a step back, it's kind of remarkable that I was able to cover this much ground in two issues of comics. Now, there's there, there are two extra length comics. There are two... 40 page comics. Each, each issue of Fantastic Four Grand Design is 40 pages. So, but, so it's 80 pages total. But this, 
these 80 pages of comics contain hundreds and hundreds of pages worth of story. And so uh, that is, is sort of like the big challenge of doing one of these grand design projects. And, uh, you know, I love a challenge. Everything I did in this comic was um, in, in service of, of addressing that challenge and, and meeting that challenge and, uh, you know, creating the, the best possible story. And in the process, I, I think a new style of, of comics making is, is being developed here, uh, you know, with with you know what Ed did with X Men, what what I'm doing with Fantastic Four, and what uh, Jim did with the Hulk, it's 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 a new comics aesthetic that um, comics is sort of desperately in need of. Uh, things have been pretty stale since since the turn of the century. Uh, uh, you, you know, so so many things have changed in our lives um, since then, and it, it it seems to me that very little has changed in comics and and comics. Um, you know, really should be on on the cutting edge of of change and exciting developments because there re there really are no limits in comics. And so, if you close your eyes and imagine what a a you know a world without limits would look like, the world of comics doesn't does doesn't really look like that today. And and but I I think we can get there. And these grand design books are are doing everything they can to get us there. Everything's gone. The Watcher, Galactus, and all his equipment. It's as though it just never happened. I got news for you. It happened. It happened. So we start with uh, my all-time favorite Fantastic Four story, The Coming of Galactus. This is a fairly straight retelling of it. Of course, the sort of condensing of the narrative uh, you know, what you cut out and what you leave in makes it into a very different reading experience. Part of this idea was that, um, you know, the entire history of the Fantastic Four, all those comics were the first draft for uh, Fantastic Four Grand Design. So there's some things that are just perfect in the first draft or, or, or that you just, you know, you have to make very, very slight adjustments to. And so I, I felt that there would be some moments in the story that I would have to do major revisions on. And then there were other ones where I could just sit back and let Jack Kirby and Stan Lee take the wheel. And so this, this is a segment where it's pretty much that. Uh, I love this encounter with this guy. Obviously, uh, Ben, it's about damn time, uh, obviously, that uh, Stan Lee didn't write that bit of dialogue. But how's about a belt in the Labanza? Ow, my knuckles. So uh, that is, you know, that's straight out of the book. Um, I'm, I'm a, straight out of the, the uh, Jack Kirby, Stan Lee. I'm assuming those are, those are Stan Lee, uh, that's Stan Lee dialogue, and I love it. And I had to, you know, in the editing process, it was, oh, you misspelled La Banza. And I'm like, yes, so did Stan Lee. And I want that double Z La Banza spelling. It's, uh, it's very, very important that we, we, we don't change a word of this. Is it my turn yet? Plink. You know, just one of the great uh, thing moments. I mean, this is, the, the thing is, I mean, he's up there with Spider-Man as like the iconic uh, Marvel character and, and possibly the iconic Kirby character. I mean, he's just so great. And it's, it's moments like these that, that just, you know, cement him in that, in that firmament. Be sure to tell your friends in the ER what a phony I am. I think the original Stan Lee dialogue was emergency room. I, I shortened it to ER for, for space reasons. You know, it wasn't enough to keep the earth hidden. Uh, this is, you know, the Watcher's big moment. This is where he really, you know, he, we've been, he's been sort of behind the scenes showing up here and there, but this is, this is his big moment. And so again, uh, like in the previous issue, I talked about the Silver Surfer that took up one third of the page, that drawing, like when you've sort of uh, uh, conditioned the, the reading experience to where you're looking in you know, row, rows of sort of, you know, panels stacked next to each other. When you get to, this is like a little more than half the page. It, it looks like, again, like it, the, the hugest thing you've ever seen. It kind of, you know, what it's like if you're, if you're in a really dark room and then when you come out into the sunlight and you're just like, whoa, what is that? And so, you know, this is, this is a, a great sort of payoff moment. And again, you know, to me, the arrival of the Silver Surfer 
and the arrival of Galactus. Those are those are my big takeaways from uh, you know having read uh, you know all the Fantastic Fours. It's like that's that's what it's all about. That's the stuff. This this just sort of you know cosmic awe. This. Uh, awe before, uh, you know, the, the face of God. Um, so here we have Galactus, and I had a lot of fun drawing him with all the Kirby Crackle. Again, the Kirby Crackle is another part of, you know, that's that's what's there when, when uh, sort of, you know, when, when the cosmic, when, you know, when God manifests itself, it's in the Kirby universe, it's surrounded by Kirby Crackle. And, um, you know, had a lot of fun drawing him you know, obviously, but you know, based on a Kirby drawing, I made some adjustments and the G, you know, um, when Galactus first showed up, he had a G on his chest. He was also colored, um, you know, brown, red, and green. I, I, that, that, that would have been a pretty bold choice if I kept that, but I, I don't know, I, I, I had to go with like the classic, uh, you know, I went with like a purple and magenta color scheme, but um, on his chest, he had the, the letter G and in subsequent appearances, they removed that G. I felt like the character never looked quite balanced without that G. And so, you know, Jack Kirby, sometimes he would take like photo stats of his comics and in, in, and color them. And one of them was like from an issue of Thor where Galactus appears and he, you know, colored the page with uh, Doc Martin dyes. And he also drew a sort of like glyph on, on Galactus's chest. And it, was, it wasn't G-shaped, but it was a glyph because I think, you know, Kirby felt like, you know, design-wise, there's gotta be something there. Like just, just an empty circle didn't feel right. I wanted to do the same. I wanted to put a glyph there, something sort of alien looking. And, um, and this was my solution. Something that vaguely suggests a G, but is, you know, not, not quite the letter G. And so I came up with that little design there. There's also in, um, in Marvel's, Alex Ross came up with like, I thought a really elegant solution to that same design problem. He sort of took, took like the letter G and sort of abstracted it to such a degree that it doesn't look like, oh, here's just some guy with the letter G on his, on his chest, uh, you know, to remind him what, you know, what his first initial is. It like, it, it read as the letter G, but it also looked like, you know, just sort of like a design element, much, much like, uh, you know, what what the Superman logo eventually became. So I, I thought it was a very elegant solution. So Galactus arrives in spectacular fashion. And they have their face off, Galactus and the Watcher, as, uh, you know, sort of shown in the second page of uh, part one of, of Fantastic Four Grand Design. And so, uh, again, this is unfolding, you know, not too differently from the way it does in the comic. You know, this is like a very, very, very faithful you know, retelling of that. Again, um, in, in those cases where where I'm following, you know, pretty closely to what, what Kirby and, and Stan did, it, uh, you know, it's just a lot of fun. It's um, a lot of fun, you know, just sort of studying those those Kirby drawings and, and reiterating them. Th this, this I, I, I feel like is, uh, this panel is sort of like a 100% original Shioli panel where, where he picks up the thing. Hey, put me down. You have the same energy signal as your planet. You'll make a nice snack while I process your world. So that, you know, I thought of the idea of like um, the thing because he's sort of like an earth uh, elemental, you know, he's sort of, you know, made out of cracked clay. Galactus would kind of view him as a mini planet and he would be uh, sort of like exactly the kind of thing that uh, Galactus would eat just in a smaller form. So he'd make a snack out, out of him. What's he making? It's a global super weapon. For what? Galactus eats like a connoisseur, the way you might take apart a lobster. Every piece, the hydro energy of the oceans, the techno energy of the cities, the human bio energy. Then for dessert, the fiery molten core, the process begins. So that's, that's all original <laughs> Shioli uh, dialogue there. You can't come into a person's home and start disintegrating things. I think I wrote that, but I'll have to double check uh, and see. Maybe that was Stan Lee, but I feel like, like what I tried to do, with, like Stan Lee's dialogue tends to sort of like puff up, over inflate, uh, uh, obfuscate, you know, and, and make things sort of grandiose. And, and 
sometimes the result is, you know, you, you get some like really impressive stuff. Sometimes you get some really funny stuff, but sometimes it just, you know, makes it just harder to understand or just, you know, it sort of like beats around the bush. And so I tried to make, uh, di you know, sometimes I, I went with the Stan and, and kind of made sort of like purple prose. Other times I tried to just sort of cut to the chase. And, and this thing of you can't come into a person's home and start disintegrating things, that that seems like, you know, sort of cutting to the cutting to the core. I, I've upset you. You're going to make me disappear. If Galactus commands, I will. And that's, you know, there's there's a page uh, of this sequence. You can, you can see the pencils, uh, Jack Kirby's pencils, and it has Jack Kirby's, you know, liner notes where he, he explains what's going on in the scene to Stan, and then he also kind of makes dialogue select suggestions sometimes. And Kirby's dialogue is very different from Stan's, and I so I went in a direction closer to Kirby's intention where the, you know, he's just disintegrated a bunch of things in Alicia's apartment. And then he's raising his hand to her. And it and there's a moment of tension where you're unsure and Alicia is unsure whether she's next, if she's going to get disintegrated next. In Stan's version, he just kind of tells this, like, you know, grandiose speech that has has nothing to do with any of that. And kind of, you know, you miss out on a very cool, very tense moment. And then the resolution when he says, if Galactus commands it, I will, is not a very comforting, you know, like I, I, I wanted some tension and, 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 you know, stress the alien nature of the surfer. And so that, you know, when he has his, you know, sort of change of heart, it's, it's that much more, uh, you know, hits you that much harder. And so again, like I, I get to do a retelling of uh, you know, just like w one of my favorite comics ever, you know, uh, you know, this particular segment of Fantastic Four that, that, um, you know, the coming of Galactus three parter is just, it's one of the all time greats. And I first encountered it in, uh, the Fantastic Four treasury. So again, this, this, uh, you know, this is a homecoming. This is completing the circle for me. It was a story that blew my mind, you know, and, and. I read it early enough in my Kirby fandom that it, it just it made a huge impression and just kind of, you know, again, made, made me want to keep coming back for more. The Human Torch gets sent on his cosmic mission across, you know, dimensional space to find Galactus's world ship, which he does find. Again, you know, it's so much fun drawing that. And then, uh, and then, yeah, and that is, it's pretty faithful. Uh, to you know Kirby's original drawing had had a blast doing it. It's uh, but then this other stuff is pretty original. Like they they don't really show you what happens to Johnny inside of Galactus's world ship. It kind of uh, in the original story it cuts away from there. You don't go inside now. Now subsequent artists you know like in the seventies and eighties and whatnot have have shown like okay what what is going on inside of Galactus's world ship. But I kind of put that stuff aside and just sort of you know did like what I imagined would go in there. And I thought it would be sort of like a, um, you know, like a, a, the last temptation of Christ or something. Like he'd go in there and it's, you know, there's like a part of the hero's journey, you know, the, the temptation of the flesh, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, you know, an encounter with, uh, an encounter with the goddess followed by, a, you know, a temptation of the flesh and, and sort of being, you know, repulsed, uh, you know, by the, the sort of, uh, you know, animal nature of life. And so he goes in there and, you know, it's not just like, oh, you know, you know, I've traveled, you know, across, you know, interdimensional subspace and, and now I'm in this giant spaceship that's larger than, than, than a galaxy, you know, larger than, a, than planets. And, um, and yeah, it's just a normal spaceship inside. Like, I didn't want to do that. I wanted it to be like, you know, some kind of like, you know, reality warped area. And so he's seeing you know, multiple versions of himself uh, and, and those multiple versions of himself are encountering multiple versions of Ben. Ben, what are you doing here, buddy? I've been here the whole time, squirt. The whole gang's here. Crystal, you made it out of the negative zone. You know, which was sort of, you know, his ongoing drama with Crystal is, you know, how's he gonna get her out of the negative zone? I now pronounce you man and wife, and there they are sharing a bed. And then, like, uh, you know, when God shows up and starts yelling at Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, Johnny, have you forgotten your mission? Find the ultimate nullifier. Study it. 
Learn it, every part of it. Take it apart and put it back together blindfolded. Know it like a Marine knows his rifle. Earth is depending on you. Do not lose your way. So yeah, he sort of, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, reminding the hero of, of his mission. And these are the moments where I get to, you know, sort of step, step for, like sort of, you know, the, the Kirby and the Stan recedes into the background and then the, the Shioli, uh, you know, uh, comes into the foreground in moments like these. There it is. Why are, you make, why are you making such a big deal about it? Come back to bed. Yeah, Johnny, come back. Medusa, what? And I mean, originally, you know, there, there was gonna be a lot of flesh, like they were gonna be sort of, you know, naked, but uh, that, you know, it was for, for a scene with Johnny, you know, in bed uh, with a lot of women, they wanted, they wanted them clothed. Uh, it was okay when, you know, he and, and Crystal are in their marital bed, but it's a whole thing, it's another thing altogether you know, for, for multiple people. So I had to just sort of, you know, alter the color so that, you know, they're wearing sort of like a, like a white slip. Hi, Johnny. Huh? Alicia? What about Ben? Ben who? Get your mitts off my gal. So that's like another, that's another scene where, that scene I'm sort of, there, there was a storyline in the 80s where uh, Johnny began dating Alicia, the thing's longtime love interest. And I mean, that, that story that that storytelling stroke just felt too wrong it it felt very very wrong which i think was part of i mean you know john byrne was trying to like sort of smash a lot of taboos and break a lot of ground in the fantastic four story and like turn a lot of things on their ear which is you know very it's very effective and and you know he he had a very successful run but uh, for like a you know for a long time fan it's kind of like oh no i i didn't want that so, um, you know, so, so it was something that sort of stuck out to me. I, I have a friend who had been reading uh, Fantastic Four, uh, you know, from very early on, maybe, maybe issue one or maybe like, you know, issue three, but it, it was some, somewhere in the single digits was, was when he started reading Fantastic Four and it was his absolute favorite comic. Collected it all through the 60s, all through the 70s, all th and then, you know, when we got to the 80s and then... Uh, you know, Alicia leaves Ben for uh, for Johnny Storm. He stopped. He stopped collecting. He like that was you know that the enough was enough, and and so that ended his his thing. And so I I I wanted to address that story point in a way, uh, you know, address it, but but still have you know um, Ben and Alicia's love story sort of you know sort of close the loop on that. Give. Uh, ben and Alicia a happy ending uh, in, in the way that um, they were denied in the comics. Now, when I was working on this comic, there was no Fantastic Four comic book coming out of Marvel. There hadn't been for, for a few years, and there wasn't one at the time when I was working on this, and that was one of the big inducements for me to work on the Fantastic Four. Uh, I, I thought I was going to be the only Fantastic Four comic. So, I mean, again, there were other factors uh, that made me want to do the Fantastic Four, but that was definitely one of them. But in in the making of this book, you know, before it came out, uh, there was uh, Dan Slott's run on Fantastic Four did begin, and when I was making this comic, it was all you know, it was going to culminate in in the the wedding of of Ben and Alicia and things like that. And Dan Slott's wedding of Ben and Alicia, you know, made it to the stands before mine. And, and so and so it does it does sort of you know nicely um, you know sort of encapsulate things makes makes you know mine part of you know part of that that larger story but I you know that was that was you know pure coincidence I, I didn't I didn't know he was going to do that so we kind of came to the same you know conclusion independently of each other there are certain things that the text just suggests and Ben and Alicia getting sort of like a happy ending and and, and getting to you know the, the text just seems to be leading there. The same way that, for me, the text seems to be leading towards an unhappy outcome, you know, for, or, or, or some unhappy moments for uh, Reed and, and Sue's relationship. I, I, I feel like those, you know, both of those things sort of, you know, grow organically from the, the text itself. The ultimate nullifier, memorize it. Dang, I was never any good at school. Johnny, stay with me, I need you. I love you. Alicia, you're a scroll. Now that was later artists who came who came in after John Byrne. It, it might have been 
you know, Steve Englehart or, or somebody came in after John Byrne and, and made it that the, the Alicia that Johnny had a relationship was not, in fact, the Alicia from the 60s. It was a scroll disguised as Alicia. So it kind of, uh, you know, made it so that Johnny could have this romance with a scroll and, and Ben could have his romance with, uh, you know, with, with his Alicia. Now, and so I wanted to reference that as well. But the, the, uh, the scroll Alicia from, from the comics, especially when like somebody like Art Adams would draw her, uh, she was a hot scroll. Like she was, you know, this very beautiful, you know, very beautifully drawn scroll where I thought it would be more fun to just make it like, you know, sort of have that moment of, of fear and repulsion of like, I just kissed a scroll and make, you know, make her look like, you know, the, the scrolls we've seen up to this point uh, when, when, you know, she transforms into a scroll. Now, again, this is part of Johnny's sort of, you know, being sort of outside of time and space, being in this sort of other world this where the rules of reality are different than the rules of our own and so and so this is you know this could be something that's happening in some other universe or it could be a complete figment of his imagination of his fears of his um of his you know lusts sort of you know made made real this is sort of like an area of mystery where where what, what happens there uh you know what happens on galactus's world ship stays on galactus's world ship we have that moment Time to go. How do I get out of this maze? And again, you know, sort of, you know, keeping like a mythological underpinning. And so I included some characters that, yeah, most of this story is within the scope of the Jack Kirby Stan Lee run. There are some other elements, you know, elements that that were important to me, that were important to the story that I, I folded in. And so one of them, I thought I'd, I'd you know, sort of find, find a fun way to reference some of those uh, heralds of Galactus that came later. Uh, and so they're in this sort of you know, strange world of, of Galactus's world ship. And so they help Johnny get out and, and one by one, they, they're eliminated by the, you know, Galactus's world ships, you know, white blood cells, which are sort of these, and these empty, you know, white Galactus costumes. And then the, uh, a bunch of, an army of, of Punishers and they get eliminated one by one. Frankie, you're on your own now, Torch. Thanks, Frankie. That was, uh, Frankie Ray, one of the, Heralds of Galactus. And so now Johnny's back. You know, to the Fantastic Four, you know, it looked like Johnny was there the whole time, just kind of knocked out. Reed's like, Johnny, can you hear me? He's snapping his fingers. Everybody clear. So big, so big, which was, you know, the quote from the, uh, you know, the original story. He, he came back saying, so big, so big. But they, you know, he's just been lying there. His his journey through, through time and, and subspace and other dimensions uh, you know, was instantaneous and invisible to the rest of the Fantastic Four. So it seems like he just passed out and had, you know, like a hallucination, uh, you know, had, had sort of like a near-death experience or a fever dream. And so he's got in his hands, he's like, I got it. I brought it back. The ultimate nullifier. Johnny, what are you talking about? And he opens his hands and there's nothing there. It's gone. Slow down. What's gone? We're here for you, kid. Am I going crazy? Was it all in my mind? And so, uh, you know, in the original comic, he comes back with the ultimate nullifier. Now this, uh, uh, but I, I thought this would be a more interesting, you know, way to go about it. And, and he, you know, you'll have a dream and it's just like a really vivid dream. And there's some, you know, some object in it, maybe like a, a, a magical key, or maybe you found some like coin that you've never seen before, some, some kind of token in your dream and you have it in your hand and you have it in your hand. And, and sometimes when you wake up, you, you sort of like almost expect to, to open up your hand and it's still there and then it's not. And you realize, oh yeah, that, that was a dream. That was, I never had that magical key or that, uh, you know, special coin or whatever. And, and so um, I wanted to do sort of something like that, you know, that, that he, he had it in his hand, but it's not there because, you know, what he had was something just, just from another reality, from another, another you know, it was, it, was, it was a dream. It was real, but it was a dream. The ultimate nullifier, it looked like this. Sue, get him inside. And so he's doing this sort of symbol of try, trying to like, with his hand, do the shape of the ultimate nullifier, which, you know, it's, you know, it's kind of cool that, that uh, the ultimate nullifier is sort of, you can kind of replicate that shape with your hand. Maybe, maybe that'll become a greeting for Fantastic Four fans, the ultimate nullifier greeting. And so Silver Surfer, after his time spent 
with Alicia decides he's going to go up against, he's, he's going to turn against Galactus and defend the Earth. He didn't, Silver Surfer didn't understand what, uh, you know, what life really meant and what it was and what, it, what human beings are. Again, going back to Kirby's original uh, ideas about the Silver Surfer, that he's, he's learning about, about mankind and about humanity and, and what it is to be alive, to be truly alive and, 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 and loved and, and part of a family. Uh, this is wrong. It is mass murder. The little pisher is trying to tell him to lay off. The thing did not say that in the original version. He did not call uh, Silver Surfer a little pisher. Let's hope he's stronger than he looks, Ben. Is it genocide to tread upon an anthill? I stand with these people. My own power directed at me. You betray your creator. And I set up Silver Surfer and Galactus as, as more of like a father-son relationship, which if Galactus created him, then, then of course he is, you know, he, if Galactus is his father and, and Silver Surfer is his son, but, um, you know, that, that's, that's hewing to the, the Kirby, original Kirby version. The name Norin Rad is not said in the Shioli house. And so, you know, we have the big epic battle with, uh, Silver Surfer and Galactus. And then, um, Sue says, Reed, you need to see this. I'm busy, darling. Huh? She creates an invisible cylinder. Uh, to trap Reed and, and rolls him down inside the, the Baxter building. Reed, look what our little Johnny did. And the ultimate nullifier, I did my best. And so Johnny, doing the best he can, scrawled, you know, what he, you know, recalls of the ultimate nullifier, the designs of the ultimate nullifier. Do you think you can build it? No. What do you mean, no? It doesn't make any sense. This whole thing is a child's drawing based on a madman's dream. It follows no geometry. It's nonsense. It's like asking me to make a square with three sides. But you can do anything, Reed. You're Mr. Fantastic. No matter what my fate, I face it without qualm. Your power is great, but if you persist, I'll be forced to destroy you. This is your doing, turning my son against me. It wouldn't be the first time a son betrayed a father. In a way, you are my child. I created you. Let me return the favor. If you are my creator, I shall be your destroyer. And Galactus kills the Watcher. You know, and he sort of collapses, uh, his, his uh, robes collapse like, uh, you know, Ben Kenobi in Star Wars. And, uh, and yeah, the, the, the Watcher is dead and, and you won't see him for the rest of the story. This is a self-contained graphic novel. Um, I don't have to worry about, oh, you know, we want to save, you know, the, you know, we want to save the Watcher for another occasion. We want to do this. You know, we want to make sure we can make Watcher toys or things like that. Like, I can, I, I want to give the Fantastic Four an ending and I can, I can end, uh, you know, the stories of the individual characters, uh, you know, wh wherever I feel, you know, would, would be sort of the most, make the most sense and give the most drama. And so this is, you know, sort of, you know, like a, like a, a surprise twist. I, I didn't want this book to be, a, you know, a throwaway. You know, I didn't want it to be like, oh, I'm just retelling the story of the Fantastic Four and, and you've all seen it before. You know, if you've never read it before, you know, here's your chance. If you have seen it before, here's a chance to have some fun uh, with your old friends. I, I wanted, you know, to make a book that was worth making, that was worth reading and that could, you know, sort of surprise you and jar you and, and uh, you know, take you on a very real journey and, and a journey with like real danger and real stakes. And so this is one of those moments. Initially, Fantastic Four Grand Design was going to be, it was going to be four books. It was going to be um, two, two issue miniseries. Much, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ed's X-Men was three two issue series. Mine was gonna be two two issue series. Uh, which would make, you know, four, you know, you know, which a nice number for the Fantastic Four. And so I sort of, you know, planned it accordingly. And the way I was going to structure it was that books one and two uh, would be told fairly straight. It would be more or less, you know, the Fantastic Four as you understand them to be, you know, sort of well, like one for you, one for me. That would be the one where it's like more or less a, a pretty, you know, concise recap uh, of of the story, and then parts three and four 
that's where you'd be entering, you know, my world. That's, that's where I would take over and things would start to get crazy. And so as the project evolved and, you know, I was told, okay, it's, it's actually, it's going to be, you know, just, just two issues instead of four issues. I had to adjust and course correct. And so I wasn't able to make a sort of clean break right down the middle of where where the, the Kirby and Lee ends and the Shioli begins. So I kind of had to mix it in a little more, which I think in the end made a better product. I, I, I think it ended up, you know, working out exactly the way it was supposed to work out. And, you know, Shioli stuff is kind of, uh, you know, mixed in with, with the, the Kirby and Lee stuff. But as we get closer to the end, it becomes, you know, you're, you're more and more pulled uh, into my world. Uh, you know, you're, you're more and more, you know, pulled out of Kansas and, and into Oz by, by degrees as, as, the, as the story goes on. So this second volume, uh, you know, the weirdness quotient definitely goes up. And that, that's an example of it. And so Reed shows up with the ultimate nullifier, you know, like he does in the original comic. Galactus, you say you're hungry? Why don't you eat this? The ultimate nullifier. Do you have any idea what that does? If you mean destroy the whole universe, then yes. And you'd use it. I'm just that stupid. So Reed Richards, the smartest man on earth, the smartest man in the, the um, Marvel Universe, the, the, his, his big, you know, his, his big hero moment when he like really saves Earth's bacon, that, that he says, I'm just that stupid. Um, it, it, you know, I'm pretty proud of this moment. And then Galactus's response is pretty awesome too. I believe you. You stood with them this day, and so you shall for all your days. He's gone. You sacrificed a lot, didn't you, Surfer? Just the universe. Silver Surfer, you know, sort of, you know, he lost the universe. He, he's no longer allowed to roam the universe, but he's more or less okay with that. And and I sort of have him in a pose, sort of like the hands covering the genitals kind of pose, this sort of being denied paradise, sort of, you know, like the first thing, you know, Adam and Eve do when they're exiled from the Garden of Eden, you know, they sort of, you know, do that pose, sort of cover themselves because they know shame for the first time. So I thought, you know, that's it, do the same thing with Silver Surfer. Of course, he's also holding a surfboard too. I'm glad Galactus didn't call your bluff, Stretcho. Me too, this thing doesn't work. It's just a prop. You mean you bet it all on a two-bit squirt gun? Whatever works. So, I mean, this, this was important to me that Reed's bluff with the ultimate nullifier, I wanted to make it a true bluff. That, that Johnny did his best to come back with the ultimate nullifier. He was unable to. He, his, his designs, you know, they were just unworkable and, and maybe it would be impossible to bring uh, the ultimate nullifier into, into our, our world. But, but that Reed you know, based on, on what Johnny did bring back, was able to build a prop that was convincing enough for him to bluff uh, Galactus. I, it works, you know, like, I, I, I'm, really, I'm really proud of that bit in particular. You know, Alicia walks right by the thing. She don't even know I'm here. I knew you couldn't just stand by. You taught me the meaning of kindness. He talks like a poet and she's eating it up. How can I even compete? If I was Alicia, I'd pick him too. You know, Alicia, you know, after sort of con congratulating and thanking the Silver Surfer for standing up to Galactus, now she's looking for Ben, but, but the damage is already done. Ben's on, on his way out. And so we have the introduction of the guy from This Man, This Monster. And so uh, in, in the original sort of two, uh, in the original four-issue version of Fantastic Four Grand Design, where it would have been broken into two uh, treasury editions. The, this would be the ending of the, of the first treasury edition. My name's Wyatt. I'm a little turned around here. Where are you headed? I don't know. The computer science building is that way. History is over there. Art department's up ahead. So I, like, I wanted it to end, so it would have ended that sort of first big chapter, would have ended with Johnny at a crossroads, at a literal crossroads. And then that's where, that's where he meets Wyatt Wingfoot. And um, that I thought that would be like a nice ending. It's 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 again it's one of those hero's journey things where you know the, the hero ends someplace, a uh, master of two worlds they call it, where you can sort of you know go in any direction and do anything you want. You know, old, infinite possibility is open up to you. And and I I think of the scene 
at the end of Castaway, where you know he's at, where Tom Hanks is at this crossroads, and then like he meets he meets uh, the woman whose package uh, he his her FedEx package he had that he was going to deliver. He he meets her. He doesn't realize it's her, and and she sort of you know passes by and goes, and you get the sense you know from their their momentary encounter that they could be very happy together. But then she, you know, continues driving on. And she, but before she does, she tells him, you know, if you go that way, it'll take you to New York. If you go that way, it'll take you to Mexico. You go that way, it takes you to Canada. That way, it takes you to Hollywood, you know. Um, and so, you know, it was, I, w I was, you know, thinking of that sort of moment. And, you know, some people complained like, oh, well, I wanted a, a, a real happy ending where, you know, Tom Hanks, you know, go, realizes that, that that was her and goes back to her house and they live happily ever after. Like, why didn't they give us that? But, um, I, you know, it, it just, you know, it, it, makes, it makes more sense to sort of end on that, at that point where he could, you know, literally, you know, master, master of two worlds and, and, you know, has, you know, ultimate possibility open to him at the end of the story, he can go anywhere, do whatever he wants. Then it's up to you to sort of you know create that little last bit of the story where he realizes that's her and he goes goes to her. But that that the freedom is the important thing for the ending. That he, that that yes, maybe he'll end up you know happily ever after with her. But but above all, the most important thing is this this moment of freedom of of true freedom and and to sort of end your story there. So that's that's where it was going to end. Of course, you know when it went from four issues to two issues you know, from uh, two treasuries to one treasury, you know, things got, you know, shuffled and whatever. So I, I wasn't able to end, you know, this chapter exactly where I wanted to end it, but, but still, you know, the moment still works. Some, some closure for, for Johnny, at least, you know, in this stage of his life, starting college. Ben's AWOL, you're going to college. I guess this is the end of the Fantastic Four. I can still be a superhero on the weekends and Thanksgiving. Now, now we're getting into This Man, This Monster, another great uh, story of the Fantastic Four and uh, the things getting rained on. This is another like image I'm very proud of. This I, I had this idea of like in the rain, the water sort of collecting in the cracks between, uh, you know, the things, you know, rocky surface and, and sort of rolling down. So I'm, you know, very proud of that little moment there. My, every now and then you'll get like some, you know, super cool contribution that I've made to the uh, iconography of the Marvel Universe, and that's one of them. So yeah, it's, it's this man, this monster, which, which is reprinted in the back also. You get, you get the, uh, the Jack Kirby Stan Lee version of this man, this monster reprinted in the back. And yeah, I, I you know, just sort of uh, reinserted Kirby's uh, collage there, you know, great moment. Again, uh, you know, you do, you do a panel this size, in you know a grand design book and it looks like you know it looks like a splash page i've done it i'm at the crossroads of infinity the junction to everywhere yeah i mean if you've read this man this monster it, it unfolds pretty much this way you know slight adjustments and then you know again like you got the inhumans then you got the silver surfer then you got galactus then you got then you got this man this monster going into subspace then you got the black panther like it's just like one after the other boom 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 you know this 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 is the the period of greatness for the fantastic four this you know this span of time is when uh you know fantastic four was was the greatest comic of all time you know it it was it was during this moment these you know this this little run and then the introduction of black panther and they get an invitation to 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 meet the black panther and so i took you know i took the opening splash from from that story where it's the um, it's the Black Panther in his electronic jungle, but the electronic jungle in those original comics, they were just sort of colored, um, you know, standard, you know, Kirby technology colors, just sort of like whites and blues and grays. But I thought, no, it's an electronic jungle. Kirby drew an electronic jungle. He drew electronic trees, electronic foliage. And so I thought they should be, you know, jungle colors. So I, I made, uh, you know, to, to make it really read as like an electronic jungle. So like some of the technology is, is brown, some of it's green, you know, kind of those, those sort of jungle colors. But it turns out this electronic jungle is a trap for the Fantastic Four um, and the Black Panther is catching them. I may not be able to see you, but I can smell you. You know, he, and he makes short work of, um, of the Fantastic Four. In a lot of ways, um, Black Panther is the Batman 
of the Marvel Universe. And he, he can sort of, uh, you know, even though he has no noticeable superpowers of his own, he's uh, sort of, you know, a combination of immense wealth and immense preparation and, and immense, uh, you know, scientific know-how can make mincemeat of any, you know, superhero team. And he does that here. This this was a part I was pretty proud of, that, that like, he would have these, like, the Black Panther would have these, like, little white dots on his hand, and then he just kind of stick them on, on uh, the thing, and they were these, like, you know, what is this junk? And then it's um, these little exploding pellets. <laughs> Black Panther was ready for the Fantastic Four, but he wasn't ready for Wyatt Wingfoot. You know, just 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 a normal, you know, uh, you know, college quarterback. And um, so Wyatt Wingfoot is kind of having his own event, his own adventure, sort of sneaking around, and and we see just very casually that that the Black Panther has Captain America and Iron Man in prison. So I, I sort of had this thought, you know, of like he's sort of he's trying to prove a point to America, that this like, like sort of ramping up of these sort of superheroes is maybe viewed overseas as some kind of, you know, imperialist move, that, that, that they're sort of, you know, threatening other nations that like we can send, you know, our sort of, at this point, our army of superheroes between the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, uh, you know, Spider-Man and everybody else that, that, you know, America has sort of like an army of superheroes that, that we can send into your country and and take the whole place over and so uh black panther feels like it's 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 important for him to uh you know through this whole exercise to sort of assert that he is that wakanda it, it, you know if there's any saber rattling going on uh, wakanda is ready for it spare me your yankee chest thumping i don't understand i calculated everything to the finest detail how did you get out of my traps you didn't count on me sometimes all it takes is one ordinary guy i just want to know why you did this Wakanda has never been colonized. In this new age of the superhero, I have a message for your masters. We are not afraid of America's army of superpowered colonizers. And now that he's communicated that message, it's like, okay, we can put down our dukes and, and, and have a delicious meal with some entertainment. I can't tell if they're honoring us or busting our chops. Stay and enjoy true Wakandan hospitality. In the original version, they're you know, performing like an elaborate, you know, dance uh, for the Fantastic Four. And then the thing says, a bunch of Fred Astaire's, they ain't. In this instance, I thought it would be more fun to have them, you know, honoring the Fantastic Four with, by, you know, putting on like a, a sort of Fantastic Four show. So, uh, you know, this guy's dressed up as the Invisible Woman. He's got, you know, mirrors attached to him and a, and a yellow wig. And then this guy's dressed up as, as uh, the Human Torch, this guy's dressed up as the Thing, and then this guy's on stilts and, uh, you know, dressed up as Mr. Fantastic. This era of Fantastic Four, it's just like one cool thing after another. And so now we're getting the, the introduction of uh, Claw, you know, just one after the other, and, and the, the alarm's going off. I think you will find it much more rewarding to be a friend than a foe. Next time you want to make palsy wowsy, warn me first. You have a way with words, Benjamin Grimm. When I was first reading all these comics, it was just so much fun, like one thing after another. And then these sort of, you know, sound wave, these solid sound wave animal monsters start showing up on the outskirts of Wakanda. And it's, you know, there's, there's like a sonic sound wave elephant. There's a sonic sound wave a gorilla. There's a sonic sound wave jungle cat, you know, all made by claw. And it's just... Just one awesome thing after another. And then, uh, you know, Claw's defeated, and then he he goes into his machine, and then that's when he becomes sort of the Claw we know from the comics. The Claw from the Secret Wars and stuff, He you know, this sort of being of pure sound. And then we get the beginning of a Marvel tradition, the superhero softball game. You know, they're all getting together to play. I mean, this, you know, if you've read any X-Men, this is where it all started with uh, Fantastic Four and, and the Black Panther and Wyatt Wingfoot, this baseball game. With a vibranium bat, anything is possible. Sorry to do this, but it's common knowledge that I hate to lose. The Black Panther's entertaining them, he's playing the piano for them, uh, you know, giving them expensive gifts, uh, fashionable new clothes. When Mr. Fantastic puts on sunglasses, he becomes Plastic Man. 
This high power mini stress reliever weightlifting gimmick is the cat's pajamas. All the treasures of Wakanda don't mean a thing without Crystal. You know, I really like that ongoing story too, of like Johnny trying to get Crystal out of, out of the, the dome around, uh, you know, which was uh, lifted for the Simpsons movie. Now they go, they meet Prester John. It's just these like greatest hits. There was a real sense of discovery when I was reading this era because as a kid, just sort of, you know, not being super versed in, in comic books, you know, you, you definitely had a sense of the Fantastic Four and all these things. You kind of knew, you know, a lot of these characters, but, but Prester John I had never heard of. So the fact that there's these sort of greatest hits moments of amazing comics where there's still a sense of discovery, where like I'm still discovering like, oh, there, here's a cool, you know, this, this, the Prester John segment that, you know, very cool moment, you know, just for whatever, because they were cranking out the hits, that didn't become one of the sort of, you know, lasting stars, but it, it meant it was sort of like a deep cut that I could have that, that sense of discovery with. You know, part of the larger narrative of trying to find Crystal. And, and then they do, I'm, I'm really proud of that first panel up there in the corner where Johnny is despondent because he's lost like another key to finding Crystal. But just when he's given up all hope, along comes Lockjaw. And then we cut back to the inhuman story and they're, they're trying to bust out of that, of that you know, impenetrable barrier and, and uh, Black Bolt's doing his best. A nice, nice you know, sort of silent sequence with the silent character. The Thing shows up to apologize to Alicia about the whole misunderstanding with the Silver Surfer. And then when she opens the door, who's there with her? Somebody better start saying something. And I, you know, was having a lot of fun with this idea of, of showing, you know, thing, things reflected in uh, Silver Surfer's face. In this instance, the thing's face reflected in the Silver Surfer's face. Take advantage of these reflective surfaces. And then again, another classic Fantastic Four issue where the thing has a big, a big brouhaha with the Silver Surfer. The Fantastic Four, you know, try, you know, uh, Reed and, and Sue try to talk some sense into him. One day I hope to understand you humans and your strange emotions. Bye. Give these to Alicia. Perhaps it will make things better. So, you know, Silver Surfer makes this sort of, you know, crystal floral arrangement for, for or maybe even a diamond floral arrangement for uh, the thing to give to Alicia. Nice little moment of closure there. And then Lockjaw... You know, okay, since Lockjaw is able to penetrate that barrier, then, you know, maybe he can take us to the rest of the Inhumans. But unfortunately, he's an animal with an animal intelligence. He's a dog. He, he doesn't quite understand what they're telling him. And he's also kind of playful. So he's taking them on a tour through time and space. So they go to some other dimension with strange uh, dinosaur-like creatures. You know, just, you know, uh, you know, go, go out and, 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 and read that whole segment from like issue i don't know issue like 40 something i mean just start with like the issue the 40s or whatever you know from like the f issue 40 to like maybe issue 70 or something it's just an amazing run of comics like do it and then that you know that was one of my favorite images i ever saw was like reed you know staring into subspace aka the negative zone and seeing all these strange creatures which again was in the fantastic four cartoon I did not grow up with the Fantastic Four cartoon. I saw a couple episodes of like the Fantastic Four cartoon with Herbie in it when I was little, but I never saw the uh, Alex Toth designed Fantastic Four cartoon from the 60s, but I, I, I've seen it in recent years and it is incredible. And if I had grown up with that cartoon, I think I would have been a um, Fantastic Four super fan from day one. It's it's a really great cartoon. Really adapts a lot of the really great sort of like deep cut um, Fantastic Four stories that 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 Jack and Stan worked on. It's just a great cartoon. Still not available. Not available streaming anywhere, and not available on DVD. Was was never available on on like DVD or VHS or anything. Not not sure why, but it's an excellent cartoon for its time. And, and some aspects of it do, do hold up. And so I, I had this idea of a uh, Herbie uh, coffee maker that like all the technology in the, in the Baxter building, uh, if it's got some kind of little computer personality, then it, it's Herbie. So yeah, like a Herbie Mr. Coffee, Mr. Herbie. And then, uh, you know, Claw shows up doing his Sonic stuff, that, that the terrible twosome of Sandman and, and the Wingless Wizard, you know, sort of like a 
a reformed version of the Frightful Four, but missing a couple members. You know, next to the coming of Galactus, you know, my my second favorite Fantastic Four storyline, you know, just slightly below for, for me, the, the coming of Galactus, but might be sort of like the greatest sort of quintessential Marvel storyline is when Silver Surfer meets Doctor Doom and Doctor Doom steals his power, steals his surfboard. Just such a great story and just that sort of Marvel magic of like you have all these, you know, balls in the air, all these storytelling balls in the air and then you find like a really nice way to have them all sort of coalesce and, and come to a uh, crescendo at the same time. Really, possibly Jack Kirby and Stan Lee's last great moment together when their collaboration was really firing on all cylinders and gelling and Jack's, uh, you know, Jack's storytelling and Jack's drawing were like as sharp as possible, just amazing. You had the great Joe Sinnott inks and then Stan's writing is like top notch and they're, they're, they're sort of like, they're not working against each other. They're reinforcing each other. It's just that, that magic gels and, and and, and it's just like their last great shining moment together. And then sort of, you know, it, it's never as good. It's never as good after that. There, there are some good moments here and there after that, but it's never as good. This is like the, the peak, the crescendo, the crescendo of their collaboration on Fantastic Four and maybe, maybe their collaboration period. Dr. Doom's got the powers of the Silver Surfer. He's gonna take over the world. He's awful. Uh, he turns uh, ben Grimm into charcoal in the comic. You know, he just sort of froze him. But I thought it'd be cool to to, to make him make him into charcoal. He's fighting Reed, and he creates like a new weapon out of nothing, as as he as he did with was talking to the Silver Surfer, and he beats he beats Mister Fantastic's face out of recognition. It's not snapping back to normal. Like I wanted a really like oh we are fucked moment, and you know Mister Fantastic is sort of, you know, disfigured and, and, and can't, can't put the pieces back together. Dr. Doom's kicking the, the Silver Surfer when he's down, lording his power over him as Johnny finally gets his wish and comes back to, back to the hidden land, uh, the kingdom of the Inhumans. But his timing is just a little bit off. He comes there just as, um, you know, the Inhumans have sort of reached their breaking point and decided to do a desperate act and Black Bolt decides to do the full scream. Not Black Bolt. No, Black Bolt, stop. You don't have to do this. And he lets out that giant scream that destroys the barrier, but also destroys their, their homeland, you know, once and for all. I stood there and watched their whole world die. You've done it. All of your history and culture, it's trash. You didn't have to do this. Lockjaw could have, and then Black Bolt, you know, does the shh, you know, puts his finger over his lips and shows Johnny, there's, there's Crystal. I'm sorry I was late. And then they hug. You know, Dr. Doom is just destroying everything. And, uh, you know, as payback for the thing smashing his hands, he now smashes the thing's hands. Reed's device, this sort of, you know, remote control electronic vampire starts draining Dr. Doom's powers and Dr. Doom chases it. And that, and that was just... The real trap was to get Dr. Doom to chase it into space where he collides with the barrier that, that Galactus has put around the Earth, the barrier that, that will only prevent the Silver Surfer from leaving the Earth. And now that Dr. Doom has Silver Surfer's powers, he also has his weaknesses. And so, and now the, the powers return to the Surfer and the Surfer destroys Dr. Doom's Latverian castle. And now we're sort of past the peak of you know, great, you know, Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, Fantastic Four stories, but still a lot of cool stuff ahead. Just, 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 it's never quite as good. And so we get the Sandman showing up with his new cosmic makeover. Reed gets exiled to the negative zone. Again, great moment. Just, just not, not quite as great as, as what was happening an issue or two before. And he gets, uh, you know, rescued by Triton. And then, uh, but they, they bring this sort of, uh, space mummy back with them they do an alien autopsy on him and it's uh, a planet of the apes character blastar keep them lawn cigar flinging fingers to yourself cornelius with his uh, blastar's blasty fingers he he 
detonates a, a, a nuclear level explosion on the thing's head. You think that's the first time I've been nuked in the face? I'm frozen. Which of you did this to Blastar? You're not the only ones with powers. I can talk to the elements. Teehee. If you're looking for a job, we sure could use you. So this is like around, roughly around the time Crystal joins the Fantastic Four. So I thought, you know, maybe plant the seeds there. And then they go and meet uh, the Sentry, which plugs into this, you know, Kree stuff. And you got, um, you got Ronan the Accuser with his hammer. The thing sort of blocks the hammer and it backfires on Ronan. And then Alicia gets, you know, led through a wall into this, uh, another strange kingdom, this strange laboratory where they're building Adam Warlock. I thought it'd be fun if, you know, Adam Warlock, when he first shows up, he still got a little bit of his cocoon on him. This was back, Kirby called him Cocoon Man. Uh, and then Stan dubbed him him. And then later on, I, I don't know, I guess it was like Roy Thomas called him uh, Adam Warlock. But I, I do like the Cocoon Man name, and, and definitely in this image, he definitely lives up to that Cocoon Man name. You know, we still got some great stuff. Like, we're past the peak, but that doesn't mean there's not still some great stuff on the way down, and, and this this was some great stuff. And uh, I had him turn turn his creators into skeletons. We sought immortality, but found only abomination. So you are my makers? He's beautiful too beautiful to behold. And then he turns them into skeletons. I am not impressed. Sue writes a Dear Reed letter. Our whole life is a lie. I never should have married you. I truly love you. You mean so much to me, but my heart belongs to some. Then she crumbles it up and then decides, no, she's not, go she's not gonna do it. And then she goes to read to sort of have a moment with him, but he sort of, rebuffs her. I'm, I'm kind of in the middle of something, but then she gives him a kiss. You know, middle of some, another one of his sort of late night kind of things, you know, up all night, uh, you know, working on some crazy new device. And so now we have the appearance of Psycho Man, which Kirby named Psycon in his initial version, and then the finished version, Stan changed it to Psycho Man. And I like Psycon better. So a master of manipulation calling himself Psycon came to Manhattan. He'd conquered the entire universe. Earth was next. We learned that his universe was actually the microverse of Subatomica. His body was just a vehicle, and he was its microscopic pilot. You know, Marvel Editorial was kind of like, oh, I don't know if we can use the word micro, the word microverse, because, you know, you know whatever, like Micronauts and whatever, microverse. But I, I, I reminded them that in those 1960s issues, they, you know, Stan and Jack referred to it as the microverse. They referred to it as a microverse. They referred to it as subatomica. And eventually the name subatomica stuck. But then when, when they started doing the Micronauts comic, they tied it back in with this Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, Fantastic Four microverse and called it the microverse. But but the microverse was part of the nomenclature from the beginning. So, so you know, I think it's okay to, to call the microverse the microverse in this particular instance. And so then when they uh, travel to the microverse, I, I reference, you know, the exact issue where they start calling it the microverse in the 60s. Sue takes a pregnancy test and she's like, oh God, I'm fucked. I, I, let, I let my guard down and this is what happens. I wonder how long it takes Reed to notice, nine months? Reed, I have something to tell you. I was waiting for a better moment. I'm pregnant, but there's something else you need to know. I don't know how to say this. A baby! Woohoo! <laughs> so, you know, he's coming. I'm afraid to ask who. Galactus, he calls me. I can't help him kill again. And so Reed tells Silver Surfer that, that uh, you can stay here. The Baxter Building is a sanctuary for refugees from all over. The Negative Zone, the Skrull Galaxy, Planet X, Atlantis, Latveria, the Microverse, the Microverse, a universe in miniature. And so uh, Silver Surfer hides in the Microverse and Reed, uh, you know, decides to sort of, you know, increase the size of his brain, which increases the scope of, you know, why didn't I think of this sooner? And it uh, increases the, the, the scope of, of his inventions and his ambitions and, and does you know, he's, he's, he's trying to create sort of like a cosmic version of the Fantastic Four and like the Baxter building as this refuge for, for refugees from, from all over the, the multiverse. We've been preparing for the possibility of Galactus returning. We're going to have to step up those efforts. And so, and he creates 
uh, an army of robots, an army of uh, Herbies, and finally does the thing he's been promising to do from, from, uh, from day one. He finds a, a, a final cure for the thing. But then there's a complication. Reed gave me this pill just in case. Guess I'm the thing forever all over again. Oh, Ben, I love you just as you are. Haven't I said it enough? Mazel tov. We got hitched. More rings? It's a wedding gift from Reed for the honeymoon. Thing ring, do your thing. So this is my reference to the Thing cartoon, which was my first encounter with the Thing and with the Fantastic Four in general was, you know, there was a cartoon, uh, a Saturday morning cartoon where the Thing, where Ben Grimm, you know, was like a teenager. And, and if, he, if he banged these two rings together on his fingers, he would, all these rocks would come out of nowhere and cover him up and he'd turn into the Thing. So that, that's the Thing as I was introduced to him. So that, that version will always, you know, sort of have a place in my imagination. And so I made it canonical and that uh, this was Reed's wedding gift. He created a mechanism by which he can freely transform back and forth between uh, the Thing and Ben Grimm, allowing him to have a somewhat normal life. Then we get Thor. As I mentioned in the previous video, I was considering the possibility of doing a Thor grand design, but ultimately opted to pitch a Fantastic Four grand design instead. You know, I got, I got to squeeze a little bit of Thor into here because, you know, Thor and Sif are part of like the ongoing story of, of Cocoon Man, him, Adam Warlock. So I got a little bit there. And, and so, yeah, he's getting, he's getting his ass handed to him by Earth and, and he, he's looking for other options. This is what your life will be, pointless conflict until the end. What else is there? There is a world beyond this one. Let me show you, Adam. And so then we get in, you know, so then he goes to counter Earth where, where his adventures continue. And yeah, Galactus is making this sort of, you know, final ultimatum on the Fantastic Four. He creates an evil reverse Fantastic Four and gives them a countdown. Then we, we have a, a flashback to, to another world that, that stood up to Galactus you know, an early, like, rebirth of Galactus, the story of Galactus's first victims, you know, the first, the first world that Galactus consumed, and they were these sort of bird people from, from Thor, uh, who were part of, like, the, the, uh, the Galactus versus uh, Ego, the living planet, and so now, you know, Galactus is looking for other options other than eating Earth, but, but while he's looking, uh, this sort of revenge story plays out. We were your first victims, forgotten by you, forgotten by history. We lured you here. We have not forgotten. Ego chomps on Galactus's head. And so then they go down in, into the microverse, and I reference the issue with the year so that it's all, it's all there. We can call it a microverse. Uh, and then, yeah, they go on some microverse adventures. And then... Um, now, uh, you know, there's complication with the pregnancy, uh, with, so I, I, you know, sent them on a sort of, you know, fantastic voyage, you know, where they, they shrink themselves down and, and go in and, and deliver this, this sort of, uh, you know, this cosmic medicine. Uh, there's only one way to administer the cure, and they ad administer this cosmic medicine to uh, the yet unborn Franklin Richards, and he opens his eyes, you know, just having a lot of fun here. He, the baby's born. They're going to name him Franklin Benjamin Richards, the, you know, after uh, Sue and Johnny's dad, but also after Ben Grimm. And Ben is shocked and delighted. And of course, he's never going to call him Franklin. He's just going to call him Benji, call him by his middle name. Wait a minute. Is this normal? Benji's got gills. Goo. I should have known. It's my worst fear. He's a mutant. And so now, uh, you know, Reed has to go off and, and so ultimately to... To stop Galactus, he agrees to become Galactus's herald, and so Galactus, you know, covers him in in uh, azure, you know, in an azure metallic uh, coat. So basically, this is Stan Lee and John Buscema's Silver Surfer origin. I just transposed it to read that he was a, a scientist on a uh, on an Earth-like planet, in this case, Earth who, you know, to save his own world, volunteers to become the Herald of Galactus. And so he becomes, uh, you know, he becomes a, a metal-coated super being, you know, who's going to travel from world to world on his cube, you know, uh, for, you know, a, a square for a square. And he goes to, uh, he finds different, 
uh, he's trying to find another world for Galactus to eat. He finds Counter Earth, but Counter Earth has a protector, and it is Adam Warlock. And, and it's a world, a carbon copy of Earth populated by beast men. This is perfect. This world is under my protection. I finally found a place where I belong, where I am needed, and you would take it from me. And uh, now they fight it out. Uh, and then um, Galactus, Galactus dukes it out with, uh, you know, the high evolutionary, the creator of life on counter Earth. Um, Galactus breaks his back like Bane broke Batman's back and Reed decides to turn on Galactus. He can't, he can't just hand a world over to destruction, even to save his own, you know, much like the Silver Surfer. You've made your decision as a Reed, your world dies. Unlike my previous Herald, there is no love lost between us. Burn. And so this is the death of Reed Richards, never to be seen again. And now uh, Galactus starts showing up on every view screen in every coffee cup telling Earth that, that, you know, you're fucked. And now it's time for the initiate Baxter protocols. Where'd Reed keep it in the nightstand? And so Johnny pulls out the, the ultimate nullifier that's been sitting there since, uh, you know, the, the previous time they used it, and he holds it up to Galactus's head. Do it if you can. This time Galactus does call his bluff, and uh, Johnny's fucked. Taller than, the, taller than the Statue of Liberty and twice as ugly. Uh, that was a line from, you know, one of, it was, it was this, you know, we're in territory after Stan and Jack. So I, I forget who it was, but it was, uh, you know, I, I loved that line and, and, and took it taller than the Statue of Liberty and twice as ugly. And so they're blasting. And now we got the whole crew showing up. Everybody's here. And then we got the uh, Black Panther Power Rangers, you know, forming a Black Panther Voltron a Black Panther Megazord, a Black Panther Mecha, which is incorporating some stuff from the Black Panther movies and incorporating some stuff from uh, Jack Kirby's 70s Black Panther miniseries. And, and just, it just feels so right. And when I was watching uh, uh, Black Panther 2, in the back of my mind, like, the, the you know, it, it didn't occur to me until I was sitting there watching the movie and, and saw sort of things escalate and escalate. And in the back of my mind, I thought, what if, Panthrax Pantherion, the giant uh, Black Panther combining robot. What if that shows up here? And I was just like so delighted by that possibility. I, I got, you know, very excited. And of course it, it didn't end up happening, but, but just the possibility of it, it, you know, if I ever see that end up in a movie, I'm, I'm going to be beaming. It's got a pretty good chance, I think. Tumazuma, I incorporated Tumazuma. Wyatt, buddy, as sort of, um, Wyatt's Mecca, and, and we just have a battle royale with Galactus. Karnak shows up. Again, like, I wanted to have a moment where all the various threads kind of come together, and it's like, it, it wasn't pointless that we met the Inhumans, and like, like, I didn't want the stories to peter out. I wanted them to crescendo, and so to have, you know, this big battle royale where everybody shows up, and then, uh, and, and, Car and the Inhumans have a role in it, and um, Karnak goes, hi -ya! and uh, chops the, um, Galactus's helmet in half, Galactus's you know head is exposed, and and again they're avenging the death of Reed Richards, and Black Bolt just screams right in his face, knocks him backwards, and then the thing is like this one's for Reed, bam, 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 and just like repeatedly punches the fallen Galactus in the face until Johnny you know tells him stop Ben, but he's not telling Ben to stop uh, because he's having mercy. He's told Ben to stop because now he's gonna torch. Uh, Galactus's head and we did it why don't it feel like we won and then uh, the Silver Surfer is there bearing witness and he throws a little you know diamond rose that he created a little cosmic rose he created down to the body of Galactus come on Marvel adapt this put this in one of your movies put this in one of those animated things put it in one of those what if things but I want to see the but, you know, I, I, Marvel, I handed you gold. This is brilliant stuff. I, I, I handed, just like Kirby, I handed you gold. So, you know, do something with it. And then Galactus's brethren, the, uh, the Celestials from, from the Eternals, carry him up to, to, to their, carry his body up to their ship for, you know, for their, their sort of, the, the burial rites of the gods. 
and we get hollow read. We had read, we had Azure read, and now we have holographic read. If you've activated this holographic simulation, I'm probably dead. Namor shows up, come with me. If this has taught me anything, it's that we don't have forever. Wah. This is the boy. You're handsome, like your father. And then Ben's going out for a walk, and he goes into this little gate, and now we got Secret Wars. Secret Wars, which was very important to me. It was another sort of entry point for the Marvel Universe. You know, it was kind of like, you know, I loved all the superheroes, but finally they made some awesome superhero toys. And so I could, you know, buy the ones I was familiar with, like Spider-Man, but then I could also buy the ones that I was less familiar with but wanted to learn more about, like Captain America and Iron Man. It's just so much fun. It was a great, a great era to live through. And so I tried to make, what, what I made um, sort of Secret Wars into sort of like a Valhalla for dead superheroes. You, you die and go to this world where you, it's like a never-ending battle. It's the Marvel superhero afterlife. And so that's where um, Ben finds Reed. And so we have this big all-out war. We get Kang not joining in the fun either. Why bother? I know how it all ends. Get to do a little mini version of the Spider-Man costume saga. A whole alien world to explore, huh? Get to draw that, the war wheel toy. Um, I, I get to show, uh, you know, it was implied in the, in the original version of Secret Wars, but I get to show Dr. Doom hacking up Claw and then, uh, Doom facing the Beyonder and becoming the new Beyonder and having ultimate power. And then this moment, like, again, I think that was the first issue of Secret Wars that I, that I read it was the one where Dr. Doom's all, like, trashed on the cover. And it's where he's like, hey, the wars are over. I'm just an ordinary, I win, you lose. I'm just an ordinary average guy. The wars are over. And he takes off his mask and he's handsome and he appears benevolent. But, you know, there's more to the story. And so Reed finds himself... He sort of wakes up from all of it as if it were all a dream, and he's in this sort of, uh, you know, the prisoner kind of village, you know, referencing the one from, I think, like, issue 80 or something of, of the Fantastic Four, and it's, you know, this prisoner-like world. He looks at a funhouse mirror, sees himself stretched. It's Doom o'clock already. So he's in, a, he's in a universe where Doom is God. Ben shows up, and holes are starting to show up in this fantasy world that he's in. There's Agatha Harkness. Wah! That's my baby. I don't know how, but that's my baby. Stop that man. And then he gets stopped by these sort of, this cross, these doom bots. He's awakened from, from the dream. And again, this is like referencing a, a Kirby cover that he drew for Fantastic Four during the 70s when he was no longer working on the Fantastic Four, but still drew covers for it. And it's, uh, you know, the final battle between Reed Richards and, and Dr. Doom. And he removes Doom's mask. No, my face. I wanted to give, I wanted to give some final battles to everybody. And so now, you know, uh, the the Reed uh, hologram is. I am a digital recording of the mind of your father. I am not a man as such, but I hope to teach you to be one. Just like, just like you, I lost my father. Your grandfather was a member of a secret society dedicated to preserving the lost history of the planet Earth in an attempt to protect the human race from extinction. But then out of uh, this hologram steps the real Reed, he's back. Daddy's home, my big boy. Daddy's missed you. Where's Sue? Reed, wait, please. Uh, his eyeballs <laughs> pop <laughs> out of their sockets. Um, maybe my favorite panel in this whole book <laughs> and he gets in a big fight with the submariner for god's sake reed i thought you were dead the whole world thought you were this isn't new is it it's been going on a long time hasn't it how long since before or after our wedding i'm leaving reed and i'm taking franklin with me so he can grow up at the bottom of the ocean and then you know just as he's having this you know that this culmination point of his of his personal life's drama, uh, he gets you know pulled into another cosmic drama, the trial of Reed Richards, sort of classic story, but like sort of a classic story where it sounds really awesome, and then you read it and it's not that it's, it it doesn't live up to what you think it's going to be. So I tried to make a trial of Reed Richards that that pays off the way I I wanted the trial of Reed Richards to pay off. So he's been 
held on trial for the murder of Galactus. What kind of trial is this? Don't I get an advocate? And his advocate is the lawyer of the Marvel Universe, Daredevil. You have a strong alibi, Reed. You were on a different planet when Galactus died. You got that right. He didn't do nothing. You want to point the finger at somebody? Point it at me. He didn't physically carry out the act, but the murder was done according to Reed Fantastic's plan, his directions. The Fantastic Four did the deed. Is he not Mr. Fantastic? This tribunal does not waste its time prosecuting foot soldiers. They're saying Reed is Charles Manson. And we're the Manson family, huh? My only defense would be to implicate my family. How does the prisoner plead? I am Mr. Fantastic, and I killed Galactus. I am Mr. Fantastic, and I killed Galactus. I am Mr. Fantastic, and I killed Galactus. So we have an I am Spartacus moment. Thanks, Matt. I mean, Daredevil. The Inhumans are moving to the moon. Me and Chris are going with them. I'll miss you, John. So again, we're like referencing things that, have, that happen in the comics, but sort of making them play out in a way that I find to be uh, dramatically satisfying, dramatically interesting, as opposed to the sort of arbitrary way that they play out in, in, the, in, the, in the established continuity. What? Who's there? I'm sorry, Mr. Richards, Reed, you gotta help me kick. And so he helps uh, Peter Parker get over his alien costume addiction. Maybe I should hold on to it. No, Pete, I think this is the safest place for it. We found a nanny, meet Agatha. Sometimes I feel like she's turning my son against me. Call me mommy. Hail Mephisto. This child will lead your armies. Go. Father, you knew it had to be this way. Ah, hail Mephisto. Your teenage years really had me and your mother worried. Hey, you guys chose the nanny, not me. So I got to have some fun with the Agatha Harkness, Agatha Harkness having a, uh, a witch as, uh, as Franklin Richards' nanny, got to play with it in, in a way that they never, never did in the comics, but I thought was very fun and very satisfying. And it, it was nice to see, you know, sort of the, the dark side of Agatha show up in some of the Marvel shows, you know, uh, it feels like a uh, sort of, you know, a pat on the back, you know, that I was on the right, you know, that I was onto something here. The, the story is, is accelerating towards its climax, towards its ending, towards its ending. And so now we have old Reed Richards and Franklin is now a man, you know, his father's son. Let's show them what the Richards boys can do. This is, this is sort of the end game of, of planet Earth, sort of, uh, you know, machine versus man. Sorry, I'm late. I had to swing by and pick up the kids. Kirby, Dan, Brooklyn. Jakey. It was fun coming up with names for, and they, you know, again, creating other Fantastic Fours within this. And so they could be a Fantastic Four, the, the, the Grimm family. Thing ring, do your thing. It's about to get grim around here. Now, this uh, version of the Fantastic Four, you know, ben, Ben's brood, <laughs> riding around in Herbie the Love Bug. Um, this, this version, they're like dressed in denim, and like I, when when I came up with this, I was like, oh no, I really missed the boat because the you know the Fantastic Four are blue, and I never knew quite what to do with blue if there was some way I could play with that. But it's like, yeah, give them denim. They're dressed in denim outfits. If I if I ever do like a Fantastic Four regular series, they're going to be wearing uh, unstable denim. They're going to be wearing like a denim made from unstable molecules. It's about to get grim around here. That's their uh, it's clobbering time. You know, it's this final war, uh, you know, when when Machine takes over. That end of days scenario in the Marvel Universe that registered with me, that makes sense with me, that makes sense to me, that, 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 that carries some weight for me is Days of Future Past. It's just, it, it, it works, it registers. And, and, and that was sort of the, the, that was sort of the apocalypse that, that um, you know, Ed chose uh, to, to, you know, build his, his, uh, his X-Men grand design around. So I thought, I thought, I mean, it just, it makes so much sense to me. And, and, and like, I completely agree with that call. So just as a way of sort of unifying the, the grand design, the grand design, you know, project as a whole, I thought that would be interesting. You know, there were a couple of creative choices I made in an attempt to sort of give some kind of, you know, they, they don't necessarily fit together in sort of a you know plot sense or whatever but I, I i wanted some things to sort of uh you know 
thematically and aesthetically unify the the fantastic the uh the grand design project you know the larger project of x-men grand design and fantastic four grand design uh jim hadn't uh, started on his Hulk grand design yet, so I wasn't able to incorporate elements from his, obviously. The Apocalypse B, Days of Future Past, just made sense to me. And and again, it, like, that, that, Days of Future Past, it just registers to me as, as the Marvel Apocalypse. It's, you know, like, I, I read it at a formative age. The, the imagery of it is just, just really seared into my brain, and, and it just makes sense. And, and, you know, the death of uh, the Fantastic Four, all these characters. So I made that, you know, the, the sort of thing. So there's this final battle being fought. And even though Sue lives with Namor at the bottom of the sea now, this is still her family. This is, she's still part of this family. And so she, at, when they least expect it, she sort of shows up to, to fight this invasion. They're, you know, evacuating the planet Earth. And, and the Baxter building is a giant spaceship, a, a sustaining habitat where you know you know the the you know the this sort of life ship this remainder of humanity can sort of escape this you know this uh, robot apocalypse and, and perhaps find life on another planet but but reed decides to stay behind and you know what so does his son franklin why aren't you on the baxter the same reason you're still here somebody's got to fight the good fight we're a team though they had many good years the end of the ff was sad the end of man was sadder still. The battle for Earth became a fight between the robots and the Sphinx's army of the undead. Humanity was a footnote. Johnny! You bum! You killed my pal! Read, Sue. Epilogue. They turned what's left of my childhood home into their base. Franklin's final four. And so we get the, uh, the Sphinx back from, you know, earlier in, in the in the series, Franklin's final four. So Franklin creates his own Fantastic Four, the final four. Humanity's last stand is going down at the Baxter, just like Dad always envisioned. It's, uh, you know, Wolverine, Colossus, Storm, and, and, and the ultimate mutant, Franklin Richards. It's just at the end of this tunnel, but then he finds his death at the hands of a sentinel, uh, of a giant robot. You know, his family fought giant robots their whole lives, and, and he's undone by one. If you remove someone from the timeline in the moment just before their death, you've made a surgical cut to the time-space continuum. What grandfather can resist an opportunity to spoil their grandchild? So there's, um, there's Nathaniel Richards, who might also be Rama Tut, who might also be Nathaniel Richards, who might also be Kang the Conqueror, the master of time and space. And he makes a surgical cut to the space-time continuum, removes Franklin Richards from it just before the moment of his death. The afterlife is cold and wet. Help! Welcome aboard, me swabby. I had a series of whimsical pirate adventures with my father and my uncles. I never told them who I was. So this is Franklin Richards' afterlife. He gets to live in the past in this these halcyon days of pirate adventures with his father and his uncles, uh, you know, having, you know, living the pirate's life, having so much fun, but nothing is forever. Take me with you. I want to see my mom. Sorry, kid. Time travel don't work that way. See you in the funny papers. Dr. Doom, mom, I love you. This is, we're back to Fantastic Four number five. And they're getting, you know, pulled back to, you know, their, their pirate adventure is over and they're getting pulled back to Dr. Doom and to Dr. Doom's castle, you know, back to their adventures. So he got to, ha and he got to have this, this moment and he, and he doesn't tell them that he's his son or that he's their nephew, uh, because that would mess up the space time continuum too much, uh, you know, but, and, and, but then he sees his mom, you know, through Dr. T Dr. Doom's time portal, his, his mother, you know, that he lost. And he tells her he loves her. I love you. And it was it was important for me to have, you know, the last panel be I love you. It just, you know, fits the larger theme, the themes of, of what I was going for with this work. I'm I'm so proud of this work. I'm I'm so proud of this final page. Uh and, and I wanted to give the Fantastic Four story is such a great story, and every great story deserves an ending. And so I'm 
So I'm so honored and humbled to be the one to give the story of the Fantastic Four an ending, an ending I, I always wanted for it, an ending it so richly deserves. Uh, but every ending is a beginning, especially in Marvel. And so continued in Fantastic Four, number five, Tom Scioli. So if you choose, this can be the end of the story of the Fantastic Four, or it can be uh, just the beginning. And you can, you can after you're done reading Fantastic Four, uh, Grand Design, you can pick up where you left off in Fantastic Four number five and see what happens to these guys after they, you know, go back through Doctor Doom's time portal. And maybe this is the way, you know, things will play out for the Fantastic Four. Or maybe by going through this time loop, maybe some minuscule minor thing has changed and maybe, uh, you know, the Fantastic Four story will play out exactly the way it plays out in the, uh, you know, regular... Uh, Fantastic Four comics that, that we've all known and, and loved our whole lives. Or maybe it'll play out this way, maybe it'll play out that way. But, uh, you know, it's just, that's all, folks. Thanks so much for joining me for this video. I'm Tom Scholey, author of I Am Stan, a graphic biography of the legendary Stan Lee. And I'm also the author of Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. Thanks so much. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.